Good morning. Um, I'd like to welcome you this morning. Uh, so far, we've dodged the rain. We're glad all you could. We're glad that you could all make it here dry. Um, I'm not sure we're going to leave dry, but uh, we'll see. Uh, I'm Bob Meenan. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Health at Boston University, and I'd like to welcome you to the uh, 2010 William J. Bicknell Lectureship in Public Health. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging some uh, uh, guests we have here today. Um, the First Lady of Boston University is here, Beverly Brown. Uh, yeah, the Provost of the Medical Campus and the Dean of the School of Medicine, Karen Antman, has joined us. Um, and we also have uh, Elaine Kirschenbaum, who is a Boston University trustee uh, here with us today. So we want to thank them all for, for joining this important event on the SPH calendar. Well, this is the um, 11th anniversary of the Bicknell Lectureship, which has uh, brought the dynamic speakers and stimulating discussion over the years. And I trust that today will extend that tradition. The Bicknell Lectureship was established in 1999 with a gift by a uh, professor and Chair Emeritus of International Health, Bill Bicknell, who we're fortunate to have with us today. Uh, Bill is here in the audience. Um, we're, I think Bill is comfortable with me uh, uh, telling you a little bit about his current situation since we, we all have a website we can go and check out. Uh, Bill was diagnosed with lung cancer uh, a few months ago, um, has a, a reasonably good prognosis, and is uh, coming to us at the end of his third round of chemo. Um, Bill, like a good planner, um, stored up a lot of hair, um, and uh, he had a, a real lot of hair uh, at the time this all started, and now it's thinning, but you had so much bank that it seems to be working well. So. <laughs> Well, we, we, I can't tell you how pleased we are that you're here today, Bill. Thank you very much, and uh, best to you and to Jane. Well, Bill had a long and distinguished career in public health, including serving as the senior physician for the Peace Corps in Ethiopia and for the U.S. Public Health Service. He has served as the medical director of the Health and Retirement Funds for the United Mine Workers of America, and he was commissioner of public health for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He was also the founding chairman of the BU School of Public Health's Department of International Health, so all of you who know about the remarkable strides that uh, the School of Public Health and now Boston University have made in the area of international and global health, uh, Bill is very much the, uh, the grandfather of all of that activity. Um, well, and in the past few months, obviously, Bill's taken on some uh, additional challenges, and uh, we expect he'll do just as well with those as he has with the challenges uh, prior in his life. So it was Bill's idea to establish an annual lecture that would uh, shake us up a little bit that would stretch the minds of the faculty and the students by bringing uh, provocative and original thinkers and ideas to campus uh, to cover interesting and timely topics. <clears throat> well, there's hardly a topic in America at the moment more front and center or more contentious than President Obama's health care law and what it will mean for the cost of health care in this country. As we know, some of the first provisions of the health care law took effect just recently, insurance companies are now prohibited from denying health care to children based on pre-existing medical conditions. <laughs> Dependent children can remain on their parents' health plans until age 26. While Democrats argue that the law will bring down the cost of health care over time, Republicans insist that it will add hundreds of millions of dollars to the federal deficit. So what will it be? Will the new health care law improve access, quality, and affordability, or will it ruin a high standard of care while bankrupting us? These are the questions that our speakers are here to discuss today and hopefully prompt us to join in a lively discussion on this important topic. Before I introduce this year's Bicknell lecturer, Professor David Cutler, I would like to explain the format of this morning's program. After the main lecture presentation, we will hear brief responses from each of our panelists, Dr. Alice Combs, Andrew Dreyfus, and Kate Walsh, all of whom I'll introduce formally a bit later on. We'll then take a short break, coffee break, and come back for a panel discussion and questions from the audience. I want to encourage all of you to participate in this part of the program, which always produces some thought-provoking ideas and commentary. And we'll wrap the event up by roughly uh, 11.45. It's important to note that we're videotaping today's program. So when we get to the Q&A portion, uh, it'd be important for people asking questions to come to the microphone uh, so that they will be properly recorded. Well, it's now my privilege to introduce our 2010 Bicknell Lecturer. 
David Cutler is currently the Otto Eckstein Professor of Applied Economics at Harvard University, where he is affiliated with the Department of Economics and the Kennedy School of Government. His, worth in his, <coughs> excuse me, his work in health economics and public economics has earned him significant academic and public acclaim. He served on the Council of Economic Advisors and the National Economic Council during the Clinton administration, and he was senior health care advisor to Barack Obama's presidential campaign. He also advised the presidential campaign of Bill Bradley. Among other affiliations, Professor Cutler has held positions with the National Institutes of Health and the National Academy of Sciences. Currently, he is a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and a member of the Institute of Medicine. He is the author of Your Money or Your Life, Strong Medicine for American, America's Healthcare System, published by Oxford University Press. His ideas and this uh, book were subject of a feature article in New York Times Magazine, The Quality of Care by Roger, Roger Lowenstein, and you can see exactly where we got the title for today's lectureship. Professor Cutler was named one of the 30 people who would have a powerful impact on healthcare by Modern Healthcare Magazine, and one of the 50 most influential men aged 45 and younger by Details Magazine. Please join me in welcoming Professor David Cutler, our 2010 Bicknell Lecturer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, it, it, the introduction reminds me of the time I was um, giving a talk at Harvard. I was being introduced by um, my dean. And um, so the dean described me as a, a model professor, you know, a model teacher, a model researcher, a model citizen, all of that. So I was, I was very pleased with myself. So I went home and I told my wife, Mary Beth, I said, Mary Beth, did you know I'm a model professor? And uh, my wife pulled out the dictionary and showed me the definition of a model is a small replica of the original. <laughs> so I'm uh, delighted to be the model speaker here. To actually, it sort of reminds me a bit of uh, the, other, the other dean who once, or another dean at Harvard who once said, um, if you took all the economists in the world and lined them up, end to end, that would be a good thing. <laughs> so I am uh, <coughs> I'm delighted to be here. You know, this is a wonderful occasion to have Mr. Picknell here to be here with so many distinguished folks and students and colleagues. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me. I will um, try and follow, I suppose, um, uh, uh, as you as you noted the um, the the goal of the 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 symposium, I will try and follow the the advice the way my wife uh, did put it to me. She said, David, um, if you're going to give this talk, you can be either witty or provocative, and if I were you, I would be provocative. So I will try and be. <laughs> I, I will try and be a little bit, a, a little bit provocative. And what I want to tell you about is what I think is going to be a transformation of American health care. Um, partly it will be of necessity because it will result from the health reform law. Partly it will be um, of choice because there's simply no way we can continue to do what we have been doing and uh, pay for it all. And so I want to kind of look forward a little bit and try and tell you what I think is going on. Let me start off by saying that if you're like most people, you're probably lost about health care reform. <laughs> so everybody knows who these people are, right? They spent six years trying to understand the president's health care reform. <laughs> In the end, of course, they finally discovered some surreal version of health care reform. So I thought I would let you in on the secret to what it is that these folks discovered um, and try and tell you a bit about what healthcare reform is doing as a way of leading into where the healthcare system is going to go. So what is reform about? I think there are really three things if you, if you boil it down. The first one, which I have here as easy, easy is only in comparison to the other things. It's not in any absolute sense, which is regulating um, insurance. Most states regulate insurance. They 
have at least some experience with knowing how to do it in Massachusetts. We are both, we have both more extensive regulation and more effective regulation than most states. So it's kind of figuring out how to ban pre-existing condition exclusion clauses, all of that sort of thing. Um, I'm sure Andrew in his comments can talk a, a bit more. There's kind of a, come, people have come to terms with what this means to do. And so it's a question, it's, it's not trivial to do, but, it, but it's kind of understood how you'd go about doing it. The second one, which is slightly harder, is to cover people. I say slightly harder because there's very little experience with actually how do you cover people not on Medicaid, not on S-CHIP, but through ex insurance exchanges. Massachusetts, we now have experience with, with that. That's uh, one out of 50 states. The other 49 are going to have to learn how to do what Massachusetts has been able to do. Um, and it's, there are going to be bumps along the way, and so it's kind of a little bit of a challenge for us to figure out how to do that over the next couple of years, particularly if you move away from a setting like Massachusetts where really everybody was in this together and we all thought that we, we were encouraging people to do it to a state where maybe they've been slightly more hostile about health care reform and maybe people are a little bit less excited to comply with the individual mandate than they are um, here in Massachusetts. But all of that pales compared to what will be the single hardest thing, which is improving the value of care. And um, notice I didn't say controlling the cost of care, because I actually don't mean controlling the cost of care. So let me give you a statement that I think is underlying not just all of health care reform, but all of where the medical care system is going to go over the next 10 to 15 years. And the statement, as succinctly as I can make it, is the following. American health care is inefficient in a way that is both lower quality and higher cost than it needs to be. And that, therefore, if we do things correctly, we will simultaneously lower the cost of care and improve the quality of care. Simultaneously do that. So, in fact, the goal of reform or the pressures put on the market, and I'll tell you about those in just a minute, are really going to be not to save money, but to save money and simultaneously improve the quality of what people get. Now, I would guess in a room like this, there's not a whole lot of technical dispute about whether one could imagine a healthcare system that was higher quality and lower cost. So my guess is most people believe that absolutely there's room to do that. The question is, how do you make that happen? And what I want to do is sketch out for you what I think is involved in making that happen and how that's likely to, um, to play out. Of course, th there are a couple of reasons for it, one of which is the federal budget. So the federal government is going to be relentlessly focused on cost savings. This chart shows you what is the projection of the federal budget. The black line is revenues as a share of GDP. Um, and then you can see spending substantially um, outstripping um, revenues. That's a huge budget deficit. That's a budget deficit much greater than any country um, could ever run. By the middle of this century, it's estimated that the totality of federal revenues will be accounted for by Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. No defense, no interest on the debt, no schools, no parks, no, uh, no courts, no nothing else. Now, that's not going to happen, but the way it's not going to happen is by limiting, at least in part, by limiting some of the spending, of which the dark blue here, the Medicare and Medicaid part, is, is, is the obvious thing to be thinking about. So there's going to be this intense, relentless focus on, uh, on that. And of course, it's going to be at the state level, too. So there are 46 states. I'm not exactly sure what the other four have been able to do, other than have some natural resource money. Um, that are having uh, severe budget shortfalls that's also going to put pressure on, um, uh, 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 on health care. One of the things, uh, uh, Peter Orzog, who used to be the budget director, wrote a column in the New York Times um, a, a week or so ago noting that public higher education used to be um, near the top of all universities and, it's, and public universities have now fallen in the relative rankings in part because state governments have had relatively fixed budgets and health costs have gone up. So the thing that has to get squeezed is the education budget. And that's clearly happened in this state as well, um, as in every other state. And so we're going we're gonna to see that effect happening everywhere. So um, what, what, what does it mean to focus on value? What do you do about it? Well, let me start off outside of health care and note that everywhere else in the economy, productivity has taken off. That is, productivity growth is very rapid. If you look at what you get for what you put in, it was very high in the early post-war era. 
um, productivity growth then slowed during the bad days, and now productivity has increased again since the mid-1990s. Very rapid increases in the amount of stuff available per worker hour. That's why some people, at least, have been able to get very rich. And if you look at which industries it is, they tend to be some of your favorites. That is durable goods, the people who bring you washing machines and cars and uh, things like that. Information technology, people who bring you um, IT services, those are all very, very rapid productivity growth. But even industries, I'm going to come back to some of these like retail trade, people who sell you things have actually gotten much more productive over time. Think about Walmart versus the, what came before Walmart. Business services, financial services, all of these things have had um, increases in output that I'll tell, you, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about. The one exception here is healthcare, where according to the official data, we are spending more to get less. <coughs> that's probably not right. In fact, we know that's not right, but still, it's sort of indicative of what's going on. The, in some sense, the goal of reform or the goal of the next few years is going to be to figure out how to move healthcare up on the list. Now, actually, to do wonderful things, to do those kinds of things I was telling you about, you don't have to move healthcare up to the top. If you just brought healthcare to the green line, which is the average, if we were just able to make healthcare be an average industry in terms of what we get out of it, that would be more savings than anything that was promised in the health reform bill. And it would make a very significant dent in the long run fiscal problems of the federal government and of state governments. So all we need to think about is making healthcare be average. It doesn't even have to be spectacular. And so let me sort of go a little bit more on what dimensions do you think about? Well, there are actually two dimensions. In fact, they're the same two dimensions you think about for any good or service that you buy. Does the thing work? That is, do you get better or not get worse? Does your car work? Does your computer work? Does the washing machine work? And second, do you actually enjoy the experience of using it? Or do you, as much as possible, not hate the experience of buying it? How much do you enjoy interacting with the medical care system? Actually, let me ask you a quiz. I'm going to ask you several quizzes. <laughs> this is not Florida, so you do have to vote. And this is not Chicago, so please limit yourself to three votes. <laughs> Which do you enjoy more, buying a car or interacting with the medical care system? <laughs> buying a car? Isn't that stunning? Medical. medical care? How many say the car? How many say the medical system? It's about split. You know, uh, people used to think that buying a car was the worst possible experience, and now we found something to, to match it, <laughs> which is going to see your doctor. Um, most people will tell you when you ask them, they'll tell you they're unhappy, that they have lengthy wait times. How many of you can email your doctor? Hmm. You know nationally what share of doctors email their patients? 3%. Which is smaller than the number of priests who regularly email their parishioners. <laughs> and it is, I believe, smaller than the number of people who regularly email the Lord. <laughs> although it's not exactly clear to me that they get an answer. Although the answer they get may be better than when they email their doctor. You don't really know about that. A third of Americans will tell you they've had test results that were lost, they had to repeat a test, they, had, they got different advice about relatively routine things from different doctors. All of these examples of people's frustration with using the system. Leave aside healthcare reform for a moment. Just think about, say we repealed it tomorrow. We have the baby boomers who are finally turning 65. They're moving into an era where medical care utilization is very high. Baby boomers have never tolerated in their entire lives anything they didn't like. What's going to happen when they start calling their doctor saying, I'm sick, and the doctor says, great, come in in five weeks? They're just not going to put up with it. So the service dimension of healthcare is going to be under incredible pressure, regardless of reforms coming at the state level, regardless of reforms coming at the national level, regardless of everything else, although they will clearly put more pressure on it. Um, there's, of course, the clinical level, too. This room, I don't need to go through all of the examples of clinical waste. I will show you one of my favorites. Um, which is, what is the most common occupation in healthcare? It's not being a doctor. It's not being a nurse. It's not being a technician, an aide, a lab tech, whatever it is. The most common occupation is office support. Hmm. 
And actually, a fair amount of what those other people are doing is office support. What is the most common thing that a nurse in a hospital does? Document things. A third of her day is spent documenting things. Typically, what she's doing is she's taking computer output and putting, turning it into paper. Sometimes she does that so it can be re-entered into a computer. <laughs> Sometimes she does it so someone can copy it five times. About a third of the nursing capacity here is really red. It's actually office support. By the way, another 10% of a typical nurse's day is spent running around the hospital looking for supplies that aren't there where they should be. So between all of that, we're wasting about 50% of the nursing capacity. By the way, has anyone heard that there's a primary care crisis? So we're wasting 50% of the 3 million nurses in the country. And at the same time, we can't get people to see anyone for primary care. The way we're going to solve the primary care crisis is by getting rid of the office, is by getting rid of all the administrative stuff. You know, I find it, you know, this, this chart for me answered one long-standing puzzle I had, which is, you remember all those middle managers who used to work at American businesses and then they got fired? You remember them all? Whatever happened to them all? And now I know the answer. Every single one of them is working in healthcare. That's what I, that's, that's, the, this is one of the great economic mysteries of what happens to all these people. Um, so dealing, so dealing with, the, with the clinical end. Now, um, I want to talk about the, what, what, what I think is the underlying cause, or at least how to, how to, how to conceptualize it. So I have here a person who's healthy, who develops some kind of chronic illness, which may turn into an acute episode involving post-acute care. And over the course of that person's experience, they visit any number of medical care providers, primary care physicians, specialists, hospitals, pharmacies, labs, skilled nursing facilities, intermediate care facilities, home health aides, hospices, I'm probably forgetting a few, durable medical equipment. Just actually physically learning how Medicare pays for all of these takes one about a decade. Right. So we, we organize everything by boxes. How many of you care about which box you get your service in? Not very many. Ask yourself the question this way. If you could um, decide where to have surgery, would you rather have it in a hospital or your living room? You don't really care other than the mess. You don't really care. There's nothing about the boxes here that makes anything be better. In fact, what we know is that whenever information moves from one box or resources try to move from one box to another box, mistakes happen. Let me give you a different analogy. How do you, in football, when does the team, when are you most likely to turn over the football, to have a turnover? Whenever you, the, the football leaves one person and goes to another person. Sometimes you make mistakes when just one person is holding it, but much more common is when one person tries to throw it or hand it off to someone else. Healthcare is exactly the same as football here. Whenever you try and throw it or hand it off, you get mistakes. And of course, what a good coach does is try to minimize the amount of that that has to happen. In healthcare, what we try and do is maximize the amount of that that has to happen. Really what people, want is they want the service. They want the care experience. So if there's one central thing that I think is going to be the future of healthcare, it's going to be to better coordinate or better organize the way that people receive care so that it is actually a whole for the person. So that someone draws a box around the patient experience and says, I will be in charge of that patient experience and I will make sure it happens well. And if it sounds like that could be a real box, think about what Walmart did for retailing. That is exactly what Walmart did. They drew a box around the stuff that you might want to buy and said, we'll supply all of that for you. We'll make sure it's there when you want it, that it's whatever quality we think is right, and we'll do it as cheaply as we can, and you'll pay us a lot of money for that. So the folks who have really transformed things have done it by organizing the way that you go about interacting with the world. And that's going to be, the, I think, the theme. How do you do that? 
Well, of course, one thing you could do is you could ship things to China. <coughs> Please take a flight coupon for your clinic visit in China. But if you're not going to do that, what else do you do? Um, so I want to borrow from the famous Russian economist Leo Tolstoy, who noted that all happy businesses were alike, and all unhappy businesses were unhappy in their own way. And the question is, how is it that happy businesses are alike? What is it that they all do? So think about the firms you admire the most, when you used to admire Toyota, Amazon, Southwest Airlines, all the businesses you think of as giving you high value. What do they do? They all have three things they do. They all have three attributes that they do very well. Number one is they have a lot of information. They know who's doing things, why they're doing it, how they're doing it, how you could do it better. In the case of um, Walmart, an enormous amount of the productivity of Walmart comes from being better able to manage its inventory because it knows exactly what's going on. I guarantee you Walmart does not have a single person spend a third of their day filling out forms. Everything is automated. You know what's going on, how it's working. Now, actually, the federal government started on this. It was, it was even before the, the famous health reform bill. Back in the stimulus bill in 2009, there was $30 billion for health IT. Um, the um, administration, thanks to David Blumenthal, has now put out um, meaningful use criteria. So most healthcare organizations are now thinking about how they can invest in IT or upgrade their IT systems to get to meaningful use criteria. And what we're likely to have is an enormous kind of revolution in how the information, in what information is available. The thing about the information in healthcare is we're going to be, and I want to come back to this in a second, we're going to be overwhelmed by it. And the issue is not going to be having the information, but how to use it well. Let, let me give you an example of that. Let me come back just for a second to um, this chart here. Productivity in most businesses took off in the mid-1990s. When did businesses start investing in computers? When did they start buying PCs? In the early 80s. It took about 10 to 15 years to figure out how to turn a computer into something that improved productivity. Now, in healthcare, we don't have 10 to 15 years. But what that shows you is that it's not just having the computer. It's how you actually use the information. And so we're going to have to figure out how to use it very, very well and very rapidly. The second thing that all productive businesses do is they have compensation arrangements that reward creating value. From Amazon to Southwest to Toyota to Walmart, all of them do this. In healthcare, of course, what we've rewarded is doing more, not so much doing better. It's actually no secret that therefore you get more and not better. The first um, person to write about this was the famous economist George Bernard Shaw, who wrote a whole book about the doctor's dilemma where he noted that it was a perfectly v wonderful thing to do to pay the baker to bake more bread, and it was a terrible thing to do to pay the surgeon to cut off legs. And uh, nothing much other than a few uh, empirical techniques have happened since then. The, what the vast bulk of the recent healthcare reform was about, you know, the 2,500 pages? By weight, what most of it is about is changing Medicare reimbursement. Actually, covering people does not take that many pages. And regulating insurance does not take that many pages. And all the other miscellaneous stuff doesn't take that many pages. What takes pages is to change Medicare payments. And the philosophy behind it is that, um, I'll state it starkly just because Andrew is here. Um, so for his benefit, I'll state it starkly, which is that the philosophy behind it is that private insurance companies have failed to um, reorient, comp reorient compensation arrangements, and that Medicare was going to lead, and that the rest of the market was going to follow along. Now, I'm going to say that starkly with the president and CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts here because Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts has actually been one of the very small number of insurance companies that actually have been on the lead in this um, with the alternative quality contract and things like that. But by and large, private insurance has not led the way here and the idea is that Medicare needs to lead the way and everything else will follow from that. There will be both collaboration with the private sector and 
follow on things. But the general idea, most of the people I know have the general idea that a decade from now, there should be essentially no payment left in the medical care system that is on a fee-for-service basis. That is, if a, a decade from now there is still a very strong element of that, then we'll have failed. The third thing that all productive enterprises do is they empower their employees and consumers to continuously improve quality. Think about the way Amazon.com uses what you have bought in the past to help you and to help others. At Toyota, any employee, any single employee can stop the production line if they notice any defect. Can just grind every car to a halt. So the idea that there's a sort of hierarchy and things go through hierarchies are um, is sort of antithetical to this. I regularly um, wander around hospitals. I like to talk to the nurses. They're extremely hardworking. When they're not filling out forms, they're quite delightful. Um, so I regularly talk to the nurses and I ask them questions like, is there a way you think you could improve the operation of the hospital or of your unit? Could you make it work better somehow? And they look a little bit stunned and then they start to say, well, yes, I could, you know, we could have this here and the patients could be this way and we could get this information and all of that, you know. So within a few minutes, they've come up with 40 very good ideas. And then I say, well, how come you haven't done them? You know what the answer is? Almost invariably, the answer is, no one's ever asked me. So we have people with 18 years of education who are among the most dedicated workers anywhere in the economy. You know, they stand for hours on end, they run around taking care of things, and nobody's ever thought to ask them if there's a way to improve what they do. Um, I'll ask you another question, uh, another survey question. Suppose you took the hospitals in, uh, around the country. I'm not going to identify any hospital across the street or anything. Suppose you took the hospitals around the country <laughs> and you said, make that hospital operate efficiently. Get rid of stuff that doesn't need to happen. Don't get rid of any service that a patient needs, like don't get rid of the burn care unit or the psych unit, but just actually make it run smoothly. How much lower would costs be? So think about the hospital you know best. How much lower would cost be if you could make it run smoother? How many say uh, zero to five percent lower? Five to ten percent? Ten to twenty percent? Twenty to thirty percent? Over thirty percent? So let's say you said twenty-five percent, which may be about an average here. That twenty-five percent is more savings than the entire health reform promised people. That would more than pay for all the coverage expansions that we, that we enacted into law. Just, that, just doing that, just making the institutions run smoother, would put us an enormous part of the way towards solving the physical mess that we're in. Actually, let me put it to you another way. You know, what the tip, you know what the profit margin of the average American hospital is? 4%. What you just told me is that the average American hospital has a potential profit margin of 29%, but it's wasting 85% of that in poor operations. It's wasting 25% of that 29% in poor operations. Find a way to get rid of that, and you've got an enormous amount of money. Anyone want to, um, anyone got some other use for that money? So this is what all productive firms do. This is kind of the path that hopefully we're on, and then the question is, will it wind up working? Let me tell you a little bit more. Um, healthcare's got, as I mentioned, so much information. The issue is not going to be gathering the information, it's going to be using it. One of the things just to note about every industry where information is a big deal is that firms have gotten bigger. Retail trade used to be local, now it's national. Think about Walmart and Target and Best Buy. Banking used to be local, now it's Bank of America and other national banks. Even legal services are now national. Healthcare is actually getting bigger too. In the typical American city, 
The biggest hospital system has 25% of all the hospital admissions and a third of all the profits. So no longer is this kind of one-off organizations. We know that here from Boston, what's true about Boston is true nationally, except in Boston, the share of profits at the biggest hospital systems are, are the biggest hospital system is actually above average. By the way, having a quarter of all the admissions and a third of all the profits means that those folks are going to grow. So this is going to get much, much bigger, much more consolidated. I, don't th I think it may not be far away where we see regional or even national healthcare provider organizations. And we're already starting to see some of that with the Mayo Clinic and in Jacksonville and Phoenix, Arizona and other kinds, of, other kinds of places. That's one thing about any industry where information is a very big deal, is that they, it just gets consolidated and that's going to happen here as well. It's already happening. Um, the compensation changes will hopefully facilitate the change. Let me just kind of give you a sense of what it means. So let me come back to this diagram. <coughs> Probably the easiest thing to do is to bundle the acute and the post-acute stuff. This is in the legislation. It's easy enough to think about happening. Woman falls down, breaks her hip. Who wants to take money to care for everything related to the broken hip for the next half year of her life? Or maybe one year or maybe two years. Easy enough to think about doing within five years. I can't imagine any insurer will be paying separately for all the different aspects of acute and post-acute care services. <coughs> um, in this case, the obvious organization to accept the money will be the hospital because that's where the bulk of the care and bulk of the costs are taking place. That's not true about other kinds of bundled payments, but it is likely true about these kinds of services. Low-hanging fruit here seems easy enough to do. Slightly more complicated is to think about bundling chronic care services. You've got an elderly person with diabetes or osteoporosis who wants to take money for the whole year. If you can keep that woman or that man out of the hospital, you can collect a lot of money. Most people think that the greatest savings in terms of eliminating care that doesn't need to have to happen will come from preventing the transition from chronic illness to acute episodes. So this is a very big deal. It's a little bit unclear who will do this. And I'm going to give you a, a quiz in a minute about who's going to do this. A little bit unclear to think about who's going to do this. Even more bundled are the things that people talk the most about, accountable care organizations. Someone just take the whole patient for the whole year. I see, you know, this one is getting all the attention, but I really see these as kind of a continuum from least bundled up to most bundled. And I think we'll see a range of them. That is, it may be some organization takes a payment for the patient as a whole and subcontracts out the acute care portion to someone else. So I would look for a lot of this to happen. None of this is really consistent with a fee-for-service payment system and, and within these organizations that is likely to disappear. Okay. The other way you can do it is you can attribute aspects of successful management to someone. For example, the primary care physician could be rewarded when someone is successfully managed as opposed to unsuccessfully managed. All of these are conceptually quite straightforward. That doesn't mean they're easy to do. It just means that conceptually it's clear what you're trying to do. And the question is, are we, are we prepared to go that way or not? Is someone prepared to do that or not? And really, the whole issue here is integrating coordinating the episode. And so what I want to ask you is, who is best positioned to do that? Now, there are actually two questions I could ask you. One is, who should do it? And second is, who will do it? Okay, I'm not going to give you any credit for should, because that one's easy. Your doctor should do it. I want to ask you, who will wind up coordinating? Okay? Now, I will give you one choice, which is you can have a multiple choice quiz or you can have a fill in the blank. You'd like multiple choice? All right, here are your choices. Okay, so your choices are primary care physicians, because they're so good at managing things, hospitals, potentially in collaboration with physicians, insurers, let me combine the next two. Anyone who makes some tech application, Google or Microsoft or Apple? Or none of the above, some new firm entirely? Everyone ready to vote? OK. How many vote for the primary care physician? No one ever votes for the primary care physician. No one ever, ever votes for them. 
How many vote for the hospital? Hmm. People either have very short hands or they're waiting for somewhere down on the list. How many vote for the insurer? Close, I would say third or so. How many vote for a tech application? How many vote that it'll be someone else entirely? If you ask me, that's the one I would have chosen. The insurers nationally have not figured out how to get into this. The hospital, you know, all the hospitals are now racing to set this up. The issue is nobody really likes a hospital. Do you enjoy going to a hospital? Do you say, yippee, it's a hospital day today. Now, what we know is you can't divorce this from the people who are providing medical care. There is no disease management tried to take it away from the primary care physician. In a fight between the primary care physician and someone on the phone from Idaho, who you have no idea who they are, people will always choose their primary care physician. So it's likely to be some kind of organization that is working with the medical care providers, but that is uh, organizing the experience around them. And think about where you could do this. I have sort of two kinds of spots where if I were thinking about it, I would start. One would be sort of very, very costly people, Medicaid and dual eligibles, who are very expensive, where we know with some management we could do better. I was once um, across the street and got this lovely, if heart-wrenching, description of the frequent flyers, right? People who are in the hospital a lot, who are, you know, very high users. and. Oftentimes, with a little bit of intervention, medical and social and legal, you can actually get them from hundreds of thousands of dollars to tens of dollars, or hundreds of dollars. And you know, you, uh, for those kinds of folks, you really just want to start sort of one by one. The only problem is there's no money in actually doing that now. So you set up systems for, for which you can deal with the high cost folks. The other kinds of things, discretionary conditions where it's clear there's some specialized expertise that's not brought together. Cancer, should you operate or not? Should you do chemo or not? All sorts of questions where if there was someone organizing the experience, you could actually have a good, um, a good way to do it. Lower back pain, we know that you can reduce the cost of most low back pain by 95%, make the treatment go from nine months to three weeks, um, and make the employees be happier. The only problem is you actually go bankrupt doing that. Um, but it's, but it, it, it's quite easy to do. It's been done. So think about those areas where we know we're wasting money, where the costs are very high. That's kind of where I would think about starting off. If I were in charge of state policy, I would try and go to the Medicaid program and say, look, let's find a way to take the Medicaid folks, take the very high cost folks, take the, take the, the, the conditions that are very expensive, find a way to bundle them with the biggest Medicare provi Medicaid providers, set up a system where if we can keep them healthy, keep them out of the hospital, we'll p actually pay more. We'll increase the rates for those people and we'll make up for it by cutting back on the volume of services. Cut back on services that don't need to be provided, take some of the money, pay higher rates. It's a very clear trade-off, very easy to conceptually see that happening. The question is just making that work. So that's, so, so that's, I think, where we're likely to start off. There are all sorts of open questions about these things. I don't want to minimize the open questions other than just to say that we're going to have to figure some of these out over the next few years. I envision that the next five to 10 years will be spent trying to um, experiment with different forms of this and see, wh and see, see which ones work. Um, and I want to draw a couple of analogies. One analogy is to another industry where you pay a lot of money. So how many of you have a kind of Fidelity or Vanguard kind of account, right? You pay them an, a lot of money. They d are doing very well. Two people on the um, Forbes list of richest Americans are the founder and daughter of the founder of Fidelity. They make a lot of money selling you a service which is helping you physically manage the aspects of saving for retirement. Making sure that the money goes from your employer to the right account, that it's invested in the right way, that the proper forms are filed, that you get the statements, all of that. How many of you, so that's one service, managing your money. How many of you um, care for an aging parent, have cared for an aging parent, have cared for a child with needs, special medical needs? How many of you have been in that situation? 
How many of you would have been willing to pay $15 a month to have someone do that service for you? How many of you would have been willing to pay $15 a minute to have someone do that service for you? Why can you not do that? Fidelity is happy to sell you the other service. So the whole idea of organizing, caring for people has actually is a service that happens in all sorts of other complicated industries, but not in health. And once we get to a point where we can do that, then things will be much better. Or if you want to think about it this way, don't think of them as diseases. Think of them as profit centers. Um, I want to. Uh, uh, oh, the, the sort of other example is, you know, trying to bring some, some management experience to healthcare. And we already see some of this. Cerebus, the people who brought you Chrysler, may uh, buy the Caritas Christi organization here. I'm sure everyone knows about that. Detroit Medical Center was bought out by the Blackstone Corporation. Actually, the, the amount of money paid is not very high. What the benef a lot of the benefit for these organizations is getting the investment. Go back. IT costs a lot of money. Updating facilities costs a lot of money. The bigger you are, the more profits you have. The little guys don't have the money. So this is clearly part of the trend that's going on, is getting some kind of new organization. Now, these folks are good at, I'm sure, managing revenue, but hopefully they'll also be good at figuring out how to run the place efficiently. And I want to highlight this in one more way, and it's one more quiz for you. So I have your last and final quiz, and here it is. What do these people have in common? Other than three strikers and you're out. What do these people have in common? Any yeses? Yes, sir. The 10 richest people in healthcare. There are 11 of them, mind you. <laughs> but other than that, you are exactly right. These are the people on the Forbes 400 list of the richest Americans in healthcare. <coughs> what do you notice about the source of their money? I'm sorry? With two exceptions, they all made their money by sticking it to you or sticking it in you. <laughs> the two exceptions are reinsurance, Patrick Ryan and Tommy Frist in running hospitals. But everyone else made their money by inventing a device you stick in a person's body. Now let me show you a different list. This is the list of people on the Forbes 400 who made their money through retailing. There are six Walmarts. The combined heirs to Sam Walton are worth more money than the entire previous list. Five home improvements, including two people from Home Depot, three gaps, a Best Buy. Anyone grow up in a town with a Hobby Lobby? Oh, you're from the Midwest. <laughs> what do you notice about this list? Not a single person on this list makes a product you use. Every single person made their money by changing the way that you go about buying stuff. Not with potentially one exception, there's not a single person in healthcare who has done this. But it's happened in every other facet of the economy. Healthcare reform, both from the government and from the private sector, is and other trends is going to create a lot of challenges. It's also going to create a huge opportunity. And that opportunity is to figure out how to manage it so that it works for people. Our best guess is that we waste $700 billion a year on health care. That's not buying anyone any good. $700 billion a year. That's the amount we spent on the bank bailout. That's the amount we spent on the much hated stimulus. Every year we're dumping $700 billion into the Charles River and just letting it sink. 
How many billionaires could you over time create out of that? If you figure out how to streamline practices, how to coordinate services, overhaul the administrative processes, take out some fraction of all of that, and what do you have? You have immense fortunes and you have a lot of goodwill, which is why I think that what's happening in healthcare is going to be a huge challenge, but also potentially the biggest social improvement of the past century. If we can figure out how to make healthcare work that is higher quality and less expensive, which everyone knows we can conceptually do, we will have made an advance greater than anything else we've done for people in the past century. That's really the challenge before us. Of course, there's also Jerry Garcia's version of it, which is that somebody has to do something and it's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. But if we accept the challenge, that is what we could have on the other end. And it will have made, it, it will have at least made waiting a century for healthcare reform have been worth it at the end. So I am going to stop there and look forward to questions and the other panelists. Thank you. Okay. You can take a seat in the audience. If Good. You're Good. Well, thank you, David. Uh, stimulating. Hey, um, Alice, you all set? Okay. I just want to make sure. Um, we now have uh, three panelists who represent uh, critical segments of the healthcare sector, uh, who will each give a combination of uh, perspectives and comments. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, Dr. Alice Tolbert Combs who is the president of the uh, Massachusetts Medical Society. And uh, she's also a um, critical care specialist at South Shore Hospital and an anesthesiologist with South Shore Anesthesia Associates. Um, she has long been active in organized medicine and has served in the last three years as the president-elect, the vice president, and the secretary treasurer of the Massachusetts Medical Society. She is a member of the AMA's Commission to Eliminate Healthcare Disparities and she served formerly as vice chair of the Massachusetts Board of Registration and Medicine's Patient Care Assessment Committee, as a member of the Massachusetts State Commission to Eliminate Racial and Ethnic Health Care Disparities, and chair of the Mass Medical Society's Committee on Ethnic Diversity. Dr. Combs was also a member of the Massachusetts Special Commission on the Health Payment Health Care Payment System, established to evaluate the payment system and recommend reforms that will provide incentives for cost-effective and patient-centered care. And my intro was perfectly timed to allow the technician to load up her. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's not that I'm clever. It's that he's good. Um, so with that introduction and her slides loaded up, I'd like to call on Alice Combs. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, first of all, I thank you so much. It is a pleasure to come before you and speak about something that's very passionate to the leaders of the Mass Medical Society. And um, my other slide says, cost, what does value have to do with it? And uh, in response to uh, the excellent presentation by uh, David Cutler, I'd like to say that um, for physicians, we're at the microscopic level, if you will, looking at how we actually make it happen. And sometimes, um, when we have multiple stakeholders come in, we can see things, but sometimes it is important for us to make them see things from the physician standpoint. So um, first I'll start by uh, grabbing the little advanced uh, infrastructure. So for physicians, and I, just, uh, I should probably just explain the hamartia. So um, recently, um, the minister of our church actually talked about uh, sin and all the sins there are, the sins of omissions, the sins of, of, of a deliberate and willful anticipation of, of doing something that's really egregious. But the sin of ham hamartia is a sin in which it is a mistake, it is a falling and missing the mark. And so for us in, the, in medicine, we have to look at how we miss the mark in terms of health care. And that means that are we good stewards of what we do? First, the human, the human resources in terms of workforce. Secondly, 
the dollars and fiscal responsibility we have as physicians. So what happens in the doctor's office is a quintessential part of how we are actually good stewards to serve the most for the longest and do the best at doing it in, in, in terms of being efficient as well as covering the greatest number of lives. So uh, the center here, Martia, is actually missing the mark. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the engagement of what uh, the economics are on a microscopic level in terms of what happens for the infrastructure. So we've talked a lot about accountable care organizations and I just wanna talk a little bit about the infrastructure that uh, physicians are uh, dealing with now, which even the discussion of transition to different forms of payment. Um, the medical home is something that historically, I was an internist before I went into uh, anesthesia and critical care. And one of the things that we talked about uh, in that day is that how do you become all things to all men as a physician and be there because it did make a difference back in the day if you could coordinate care. So medical home is a means in which we talk about how can you actually provide a 24-7 system where a patient would actually come to you or come to one of your coverage docs or someone within the system to actually not engage in the hospitalization, um, uh, well, in, inappropriate hospitalization or emergency visits. So uh, a part of uh, that picture and fast forward 25 years later has engaged in a different type of landscape in medicine altogether. For instance, um, the crisis in primary care in terms of doctors wanting to go into primary care, there's a whole gamut of reasons why that has happened. And not to mention the uh, Benjamins, as we say, in terms of the discrepancy between compensation and reimbursements between the primary care docs and the specialty docs. It is naturally, uh, a, a, you know, if you go to medical school and your debt is 200 to 250,000 when you finish, and you're going to be offered a salary of 80 to 130,000 when you finish your training, then you, it's going to take you a long time to cover a mortgage for a house that you do not see. Um, Let's talk about the cost of doing business. For us as physicians, we have all kind of encroachments on our capacity to do business. For instance, I can tell you that as of recent, we're dealing with things such as the sustainable growth rate with, with a potential of a nearly 30% reduction in reimbursements from Medicare taking effect in the end of December. In addition to that, I just testified at the Institute of Medicine a week ago regarding this new geographic price cost index, which says that the practice index, which says that the cost of doing business in Massachusetts, we know, is more expensive than doing, the doing business in Iowa or Montana. Interesting enough, there are the rural states that say, guess what? We think that there should be a floor in this index, which is the multiplication of what they do for the monies received from Medicare. We think that all the states should be equivalent. Well, that's just not right, is it? Because if you take the square footage of rental and you take the, what you have to pay to hire a secretary and clerical services and all the things that make it happen in the doctor's office, it's so much more of a discrepancy in terms of the cost of doing business in Massachusetts. So we argued for that point. In addition, we have recently discovered that although you look at the AMH data that says Massachusetts is the most well-endowed state in the entire United States with doctors, somewhere between 400 and 500 you know, doctors per 100,000 pa patient population. So everyone says, oh, Massachusetts is a doctor-rich state. But as it turns out, we've been working with the Board of Registration to only to discover that, guess what? We have 37,000 uh, 37, doctors registered, including trainees and the likes. And then we, as we drill down, we find out that only 22,000 of them ha have addresses that are listed within Massachusetts. Then you drill down some more in terms of the FTEs, whether they're administrative and whether they're full-time FTEs. We come down to a number that's probably less than 8,000 that are primary care for a population of 6.5 million people. So although on paper it looks like Massachusetts has a very robust physician workforce, indeed there are stresses. And recently we did a uh, survey which indicated the crisis areas that we used to have um, are still there. In addition, we have included things like neurology, uh, family practice, and those are the factors that should weigh in when we talk about how do we make it happen in terms of transitioning with healthcare reform. External 
there are so many factors, and I think David alluded to some of them, and I'm going to uh, skip over that and just go into decision analysis. How do we get there? The cost of hemartia, missing the mark. I'm going to give you some examples of clinical examples. Recently, I don't know if there's anyone in here who's a physician in the critical care area, but in critical care, when a person comes in in septic shock, we have a whole algorithm we follow. We do goal-directed goal therapy. We put in the central line. We look at the pressures. We run this amount of fluids in. We follow them, titrate, add pressures, this, that, and the other. Well, we used to have this algorithm that included this activated protein C, which is known as the, the commercial name is Zygris. Zygris is incredibly expensive. At the drop of a hat, $3,000, $4,000, okay, at, at, at the drop of the drug, okay? And we thought... The literature really gave us a real good impression that this could redu reduce mortality by 30%, okay? But the study was a very, very uh, criticized study, well done, but criticized in terms of the subset of patients that actually benefited. After some rigorous study, some reevaluation and recent research, the Society of Critical Care and the American College of Chest Physicians came out with after, current, after reviewing the literature, guess what? Zygris is not as good as we thought. And we have new information to indicate this. A specialty society came out with that. Doctors peer group said this. It came out that this was not beneficial. What happened to the use of Zygris after that? It hit the floor. So my point is, and all of these things, these highly innovative technological procedures, uh, some of the device implementation, one example is implementing an AICD in this new category of patients post-cardiac, uh, post-cardiac, um, plus MI and congestive heart failure with transient arrhythmias around their heart attack. So if you look at when a specialty body comes out with a recommendation, it is the strongest thing for physicians who are in the trenches. The disconnect is, the hemartia is, the knowledge base of the practicing physician and connection with the specialty societies. That has to be married, okay? Now we do have disputes. In Lyme's disease, we have this major ongoing battle, which is a major thing between the ID society and now this new form Lyme society in terms of chronic treatment with antibiotics. And the discrepancy between the cost of which society that you agree with is incredible. So on the microscopic level, physicians have to come to the table for, for specialty societies to have an incredible improved tenacity with evidence-based data. And I think that's, that's, that's got to be an essential piece of this. Now let's talk about disparities in costs. You know that the Institute of Medicine in 2002 came out with data that indicated that Racial and ethnic minorities are basically treated differently. And because of that treatment, there is a potential savings of 200 plus billion dollars. Okay. What does that mean? That means that if you present with a later stage disease, it's going to take more intervention. There's a possibility that someone has a polyp on the endoscopy. The gastroenterologist snips it and it was having a little bit of malignant transformation. They scheduled them for a recurrent view. But the possibility that, yeah, I don't want to do the colonoscopy. Let's just wait. The patient's doing fine. I, you know, we'll do a couple of guaiacs. You know, they're negative. What if that patient's over a couple of years and, and waiting to see, comes up with a colonic cancer that winds up to be through the muscularis and, you know, some peritoneal C? That is a much more expensive and costly venture. Now, from the payer side, you may look at it like shorter life expectancy and death. And death is cheap, okay? But from a quality standpoint and from the potential of long-term intervention in that patient, it's much more costly. It's much more, and it's doing what we should do, and that is to decrease the burden of disease, early intervention, make a difference in the lives. So I think that that's, that's a piece of it, piece of missing the mark, the marrying of the knowledge. And, that, and that, that's, I'm just going to talk about uh, next is the end of life issue. Now, in the ICU, someone will say, oh, Dr. Coombs, come, come, come. We got a problem with this patient. And I wind up going to see the patient. You know, it's, you know, you know, it's this patient that is elderly. No one has had the discussion. 
the setting of the sun discussion, I say, okay? The other day, we had an 88-year-old with an electric colonoscopy for a routine screening, perf colon. So what's the decision that went into this process? An 88-year-old lady who has possibly a polyp or something like that, and she gets a perforation, and the escalation of care. So at some point, somebody's weighing what is the benefit and the risk to an 88-year-old lady. I had another case a few months back, a 94-year-old who had atrial fibrillation. We know what the algorithm is recently in terms of risk, high risk, low risk. Does the doctor know that this patient is really, really a risky patient to put on blood thinners? Kaboom! Subdural hematoma. Wow. So they come to the emergency room. No discussion of end of life because that doesn't really happen all the time. And I want to digress here for one minute. Part of the change that has to happen is it has to be taught that you have a patient, you should discuss end of life choices before the end of life problems evolve. It's simple, right? It does not happen. And I'm more impressed with the newer cohort of hospitals that we have at our hospital that that discussion isn't had. And I am angry when I come to the patient's bedside and you, at the last minute, if the patient is tachypnic and they're breathing like this, I have never seen a patient that I said, do you want the tube? They say, give me the tube and put me to sleep or whatever you can do to get rid of. The, the air hunger is the most uncomfortable feeling. We've talked to patients and it is the most uncomfortable feeling. They want anything to get rid of that sensation. So that's the wrong time to discuss with them, do you want to be on, do you want to be on the respirator? Do you want to be on that breathing machine? They all say, do something. Yes. It's hard for them to say no when they have this sensation going on. So that education piece has got to happen. The end of life, and we know the statistics in terms of how much money is spent at the end of life. And then the next case, this happens, 58-year-old, because of the age, more than because of the disease. Col colonic cancer, metastatic pulmonary hepatic mets, has an upper GI bleed. No end-of-life discussion. Develops respiratory failure. That patient gets placed on the respirator. Now, I will say this much. Because we have a 24-7, and we meet leapfrog criteria, which is another piece of quality benchmarks to help us get to there, I think that makes a difference because we feel comfortable with saying, this family does not want this. We will do a terminal extubation. We will make this family prepared that these things could happen once we take this patient off the respirator. It's not, it's not a black and white situation where a patient gets on the ventilator and stays there for days until everyone just kind of ruminates day after day after day after day, which each day is all this intervention because the nurses will do what they normally do and the doctors will do what they normally do without the consideration, and when the discussion happens, that's when the withdrawal care, and that's when the intervention stop. So there are lots of areas of evidence-based guidelines. When we talk about the ACOs and what happens and the issues um, from the standpoint of how can we implement these evidence-based guidelines, I'll give you uh, one example from this screen, and that is that if you use N-acetylcysteine for renal uh, prophylaxis for uh, acute kidney injury for dye-induced kind of kidney disorder, kidney dysfunction, patient goes for cardiac cath lab, uh, for, has, has got marginal function, diabetic, or whatever. If you use N-acetylcysteine, the literature says, guess what? You decrease the chances, you decrease the chance of having uh, acute renal failure. Why isn't it done? Recently, uh, we actually had, uh, we have Brigham residents who rotate on the surgical service, and um, they said, well, we got to give bicarbonate for um, the patient. They're going down for uh, a cath. And I said, do you understand? I, I, know you, I know you're from the ivory tower and all, but do you understand there is absolutely no benefit to what you're doing. There, there, there's no literature to support that. So we do this all the time at my hospital. I said, well, not quote people, quote literature. And so that at the microscopic level, this education piece is really imperative. And uh, I'll go on here. Um, not in the doctor's office. We saw that uh, from our own data, the ED visits after Chapter 58 um, went up, but went up a little bit more than usual. The average uh, increase in ED visits from year to year is 25 to 
okay? So we're slightly over 3%. But looking at the ED visits and when they occur, the bulk of them occur from 9 to 5 when doctors are actually in their office. This is a study from Health Affairs that just came out in September. And basically, the top line talks about the healthcare workforce. And you can see the distribution. 5% of docs are emergency room docs, and you see the distribution of specialists, which is 60%. So 40% fall under emergency room docs or primary care specialists. Then look at when a patient has an acute flare-up, where does the patient go? And so in the blocks are incorporated you know, the privates, the publics, the Medicaid. It turns out the pediatricians do a better job of seeing Medicaid patients when they have acute flare-ups. Pediatricians are like uh, the poster child for doctors. They're happy and they make no money. <laughs> just, you know, I, I mean, you think about uh, this dynamic in and of itself in terms of cost savings. It's absolutely incredible. Because if it's not occurring in the doctor's office, and it should occur in the doctor's office, how do we get there? How do we get there? And we have argued that medical home will do the trick, but also, you know, having that support and the information that needs to transcend to the doctor, to the patient, doctor, to the specialty society, evidence-based guidelines, you know, why you shouldn't go to the emergency room, we can take care of, we can handle you here, but the patient's got to feel it. The patient's got to have that kind of relationship. I want to talk a little bit about defensive medicine. The fear. The fear of medical liability drives physicians to do things. I, hemartia, right here. Right here. I've done it. I'm guilty. 83% of physicians admit to practicing defensive medicine. And if you look at it, the unnecessary tests, you know, x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, estimated costs is, is, is ab absolutely millions to billions of dollars spent. We need to address it, and it's important. And the little side picture is in uh, me in Ghana. There really isn't no defensive medicine there. And uh, it's just a whole different paradigm. And it's a place that, uh, you know, uh, I go and I feel like totally comfortable with taking care of the patient. And there's also no notes either. Um. <laughs> so things go better for physicians, for patients. When we consider the evaluation of changing patient demographics, workforce dynamics, resource and capitation, uh, pricing, liability, the patient's ethos, and I am one who really believes that there has to be a change within the patient's ethos as well. And we can do the patient benefit designs, but guess what? Even with the patient benefit designs, if we do nothing to change obesity and the chances of metabolic syndrome, even with your so-called fancy design, guess what? They still come into our system a little later, but they'll be there. And so I think it's really important for us to address that. I, I think that we have to come to the table with a collaborative approach. No one thing is going to be a sole, a golden bullet. We have to have a multi-pronged approach. And with that, um, I'll end. Thank you. Our next uh, panelist is, uh, in some ways, the new kid on the block. Uh, Andrew Dreyfus was recently named uh, President and CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, the state's largest health insurer with over 2.5 million members. Uh, but those who know Andrew realize he's not new on the block at all. He's been involved in health care in Massachusetts for many years. Uh, before being named to head Blue Cross Blue Shield, he served as Executive Vice President of Healthcare Services for Blue Cross. And in that position, he was responsible for the company's health and wellness performance measurement and improvement and provider contracting divisions. He also led the company's healthcare collaborative initiatives to improve the quality and safety of healthcare in Massachusetts. Andrew previously served as the first president of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation of Massachusetts, and he, which worked to expand access and to reduce barriers to healthcare for residents of the Commonwealth. During his tenure, the foundation awarded nearly 17 million in grants to community organizations and launched a series of policy initiatives, including the Roadmap to Coverage, which contributed significantly to the successful patches of Chapter 58, the state's landmark 2006 health care reform law. Andrew was a member of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Special Commission on Health Care Payment System and serves on the board of the Kenneth B. Schwartz uh, Center, the Harvard Risk Management Foundation, the United Way of Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley, 
and the Board of Advisors for the Brigham and Women's Hospital Center for Surgery and Public Health. Prior to joining the foundation, Andrew served as Executive VP of the Massachusetts Hospital Association and earlier on as Massachusetts Undersecretary of Consumer Affairs and Business Regulation. Andrew, welcome to the stage. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Bob. Um, so I, we had 10 minutes, and so for 10 minutes I want to give you, um, oop, oh, I want to, bad, I need help, okay. Um, I'm going I'm to try to give you five thoughts uh, in 10 minutes, I have two minutes per thought. and. Um, and what I want to suggest to you is, I actually have the opportunity to see, um, to just tell me how to advance. Is this a, that, okay, go that much easier. Um, I had the opportunity to see David's slides in advance. And I'll tell you, he's right, but I don't think we have as much time as he suggested. So he kind of talked about, we have this 10 year period where all these changes have to happen. And I don't think we have 10 years. I think actually the window, a little depend a little bit on the, uh, the, the national elections, maybe two to four years. And I would suggest that if we don't solve the affordability and value question that David posed for us, it will be solved for us. Every other Western democracy sets a budget for healthcare, and they do it in public systems like in, in the UK, they do it in mixed systems like in Canada, they do it in private systems like in the Netherlands and in, in Switzerland, but they set a budget for healthcare. And we could have a budget set for us in healthcare, and I think government will do that. So five thoughts about what we need to do during this transition. The first is that failure is not an option, because I think having government set a budget for healthcare will feel very un-American and will produce incredible political conflict and will actually delay our ability to make the kind of value-based progress that David suggested. Second is that we have a secret weapon which no one's really talked about yet, which is data, and I want to talk about that. Third, as we think about how we have to change our healthcare system, I think we ought to think about form following function and how we organize healthcare, and I'll talk about that. We have to redefine medicine, which has been an individual sport. Even Alice was talking, and it's really, it's a team sport. And I know Alice knows that because she works in teams. And finally, we have to think of this as all of our problem, not a problem of physicians or hospitals or payers or a government, but all of us together, and I think we can solve it together. So let me talk about why I think failure is not an option. Because healthcare is breaking everyone's budget. David talked a little bit about government budget. Healthcare is kind of the pac band that's eating up other resources. Um, there were 29 kids I discovered when I went to parents' night in my sixth grade daughter's Spanish class. This, and when the teacher said I got 29 kids in the class, all the parents kind of started looking around, getting nervous and worried. There's one reason for that, because healthcare is such a big part of municipal budgets in Massachusetts because it's growing so fast. So healthcare premiums have been growing about 10% per year every year for the last five or six years. In private employers, they're suppressing wages. In public employers, they're eating up other important goods and services like education, as David said. And for individuals, although there's a new debate about this that was on the pages of the Wall Street Journal yesterday, some studies suggest that half of all personal bankruptcies can be traced to an inability to pay a health care bill. So whether it's government, employers, or individuals and families, the three made purchases of care, it's too much. Now, David talked about cost control. And there are three groups, as I mentioned, who purchase health care, employers, government, and individuals. And the problem, I think, with the federal law is that it all got defined up in that upper right-hand corner. I believe, and in fact, I believe it in part because I trust David, that the analysis that he and others have made are, are correct, that to the federal government, this is budget neutral. But that's how the cost control debate or the affordability question got defined at the federal level. Is it going to cost the federal government more money? What is it going to do to the deficit? So I think it probably helps individuals because there are a lot of very positive features of the bill. But I would tell you, I don't think it helps employers and premiums are going to go up, 
and there's a debate right now how much of the premiums are attributed to national reform. The, the federal government's right, it's about one to two percent this year. But what happens when Medicare starts cutting and hospitals and physicians start switching their costs, cost shifting, to private plans like Blue Cross or Harvard Pilgrim or Tufts? Employers are going to pick that up. So I will tell you that while it's cost control success for the federal government, not success for private employers. So what do we have to do? The only way, I think David said, is to switch to a value-based system. And the only way we can get, ring all those 30% of waste that David talked about is if we change the delivery system so it's more coordinated. And the only way to do that is to change the way we pay for care. On the left is how we pay today. The more you do, the more you get paid. Right now, if an outpatient practice at Boston Medical Center or the Brigham or South Shore Hospital successfully manages a patient with chronic illness such that they're not admitted to the hospital, they get paid less. If they, if they don't successfully manage that patient with chronic illness and they're admitted to the hospital, they get paid more. Isn't that backwards? If you're a patient in a hospital and you get an infection and you stay longer in the hospital, we pay more. If they prevent the infection, we pay less. It's backwards. So what we need to move is from this current system to an alternative system. And in Massachusetts, as David suggested, we have the largest private payment experiment in the country. 300,000 Blue Cross members now are affiliated with primary care physicians who are agreeing to that model on the right. They're accepting a global payment. It was, you know, saw when David gave his models, he showed what's the easiest, the so-called episode-based payment, what's harder, what's the hardest. We're already there. 300,000 members, several thousand physicians are now saying, I'm willing to be accountable for the cost and quality of the care of my patients, by the way. Should give her credit because Alice's uh, uh, hospital and uh, physicians are included in that project. So, but it's not enough just to say to a group of physicians, "Here's a monthly payment per per patient per month," or "Here's an annual payment." Go figure it out. As as um, Alice said, there's a lot of infrastructure needs, and David talked about the business opportunities that will be created when someone's smart enough to figure that out. Well, I would say, again, we have to start doing it now, and we are. So we have a dozen practices with several thousand physicians who are now in this new payment model. And what we're doing is we're working very differently with them. So it used to be that every year, every other year, health plans like mine would get in arguments and fights with physician groups like Alice's or hospitals like Kate's over how much we're going to pay. And there were big fights, and sometimes they were very private fights, and once in a while they become public fights. And it was essentially an adversarial relationship. And then we'd have it, and then two years later, we'd have to have it again. Under this new model, we have five-year partnerships between the plan and the physicians and the hospitals, where we say, we're going to work together to make you successful, and so that you can, you can thrive under this model. And data is one of our secret weapons. So we're now providing to these groups of hospitals information on a daily basis, in some cases, where are, those, where are those patients that have ended up in the emergency room? What this shows you, this, and some of the information we're providing is trying to get to that question of ineffective, unnecessary, wasteful care that David showed you. And we, I have 100 of these. I just picked out one. So patients uh, present to a gastroenterologist with reflux disease, fancy word for indigestion. And there are a lot of treatment options that a physician has. They can pre prescribe a medication, and there's a whole range of medications. But some say, you know, I'm worried about you. There are certain conditions, precancerous conditions called Barrett's esophagus that I want to, I, I worry you may have, so I'm going to do an endoscopy, which is very expensive. You would think, as, as Alice said, that there'd be some standard practice. But this is all the gastroenterologists in Massachusetts. And this is a group, the those yellow arrows is a group of five who practice right next to each other in the same office, meeting weekly, and they have no idea that one of them does endoscopies on 95% of his or her reflux patients, and one only does it half the time. And all of them are above that purple line, which is the statewide average. There's so much variation in care, and if we can provide the health plan, or a third party can provide that information to physicians at the point of care to help them support their decision making, we can, we can save a lot of money. So third point, form follows function. So David talked about these, and, and, 
and uh, these new accountable care organizations, Alice mentioned them as well. Everyone thinks we have to have these big, massively organized, vertically and horizontally integrated system like some large systems we have in Boston. Not true. The first group that signed up for our new payment model was the Hamden County Physicians Associates. Small practice, Western Massachusetts, willing to accept accountability for cost and quality, but we also have big hospitals like Tufts Medical Center in. And I should suggest to you that we need to experiment, that we not ought to uh, subscribe to a single view of what kind of system can be successful. Medicine is a team sport. Um, David's right, that we, and, and Alice is right, we have a crisis with primary care, but the solution is not simply to train more primary caregivers, which we ought to do. The first thing we ought to do is, first of all, have every patient actually choose a primary caregiver. Half of our members are in so-called PPO products. They don't choose a primary caregiver. Everyone should choose a primary caregiver, but it's not going to be an individual. It's going to be a team. And you know who's the, probably the most important person on the team? Not the primary caregiver not the nurse, it's the patient. The patient has to be part of the team and has to be recognized by the medical establishment as being part of the team because we know when patients are engaged in their own care, they do so much better. They get healthier quickly. They comply with the orders from their physician and their care team and it's, it's going to look very different. My final point is that we all have to get together in this and those of you who are old enough remember the 1960s. There was a famous line, I think it was attributed to Eldridge Cleaver, for those of you with real, that if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. You know, everyone had to get in. Well, I would suggest there's a, a slightly different version of this that we have to pay attention to, which if you're not part of the problem, you cannot be part of the solution. We are all part of the problem. Everyone in this room, patient, caregiver, administrator, scholar, expert, um, we're all part of the healthcare problem. I don't think we have the, the decade that David may have suggested that until we get to a more value-based system in which we eliminate a lot of the unnecessary spending, the, the purchasers of care, families, employers, and government can't wait. We have the tools today. We have to reorganize care. We have to pay differently for care. Um, and then I think we can actually have a healthcare system that David described that produces value uh, that we can all believe in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm looking to see if Kate has any cultural references. We've, so far, we've had uh, Jerry Garcia and Eldridge Cleaver. Um, half the audience may not even remember those folks. Uh, uh, well, it's a pleasure to, uh, to welcome our next door neighbor. Uh, Kate Walsh is president and CEO of Boston Medical Center, which is a not-for-profit 639-bed uh, academic medical center, the primary <coughs> teaching affiliate of BU School of Medicine and uh, as I said, right across the street from the School of Public Health. Uh, dedicated, as their tagline so eloquently puts it, to providing, quote, excellent care without exception, unquote. BMC is a community-focused hospital with approximately 5,000 employees, 1,300 physicians, and an annual operating budget of roughly $1.5 billion. As the direct descendant of Boston City Hospital, BMC serves as the safety net hospital for the city of Boston. Prior to her appointment at BMC in March 2010, Kate Walsh served as Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Brigham and Women's Hospital for five years. During her tenure, Brigham and Women's Hospital moved its patient satisfaction scores to the 95th percentile of benchmark institutions nationally, produced strong operating results based on consistent ambulatory and inpatient growth, and set a new standard in patient-focused multidisciplinary care with the opening of the Carl J. Roof, Carl J. and Ruth Shapiro Cardiovascular Center. Kate also served at, previously as Chief Operating Officer for Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome our next door neighbor whose office is actually in the Talbot Building, uh, Kate Walsh. Thank you. I actually think I'll just leave that slide up. But <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I'm very glad to be here today. I, uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, uh, sort of the specifics of healthcare reform, particularly as it affects safety net hospitals. Can everyone hear me? Am I mic'd? Okay, great. No. Can you hear me now? Cool. Okay, great. 
so I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, what expanded coverage means, uh, the role of safety net hospitals, the impact specifically on Boston Medical Center. I think we've had sort of broad national trends. We've talked about this from the perspective of physician practices. Andrew's talked a lot about sort of the system and how we're going to pay for it. And I thought I'd drill it down a little bit to how our organization functions um, and, and a little bit about some of the lessons we're learning in the early early stages of healthcare reform. Because in many ways, as, uh, as you all know, Massachusetts is ahead of the rest of the country and I think there are some lessons learned for all of us. I just want to make sure that everybody uh, kind of leaves with an understanding of who are the newly insured in this country. And they are, by and large, uh, probably, and these numbers aren't exactly right, and I'm sure uh, David Cutler knows the specifics, they are largely uh, low-income folks who will, will either fall into Medicaid programs because there will be enhanced Medicaid programs, and I'm, we think about half will fall into, um, half the 32 million newly insured will fall into state Medicaid programs, and the other half will be privately insured, but largely low and moderate income folks who will probably be picking higher deductible products, which will end up being a challenge for organizations like ours as people are challenged even with insurance to, um, or, or, or even with the right to sort of access to actually pay their health care bills. So the new, I submit that the newly insured in this country are patients of safety net hospitals. And I think that there's an organization and a system of care to care for these folks, and I think it's, it's important that we think a little bit about it. So what is a safety net hospital? Um, I put this slide up in a previous talk, and I, other than a really bad and ugly collection of logos, I, I think if you've seen one, you've seen one. There's, a, there's the city on the hill. There's the hands of Hedenpin country. I'm particularly fond of Boston Medical Center's uh, uh, logo and its tagline of exceptional care without exception. But you've got to wonder, from a public health perspective, whether we all need level one care uh, for all. <laughs> because we're, uh, so no matter what you need, you, could, you get trauma center care. Um, <laughs> so there's a mix of hospitals. And these hospitals are, are the people who are caring for the uninsured. And I submit they'll be caring for the newly insured. And, and there's some strengths and weaknesses of these systems. They're fantastic systems in many ways. Bob trained at the old Boston City. You talk to people, physicians around the country, nurses around the country, pharmacists around the country, they've always virtually everyone spent their time in a city hospital. They, they kind of came up through systems where they learned how to care for patients, often in an urban safety net environment. And there are many strengths of these, of, of these hospitals. They are, the first is the mission. They're dedicated to caring for the most vulnerable in society. You know, the macroeconomic viewpoints are, uh, are, are very, perspectives are very important, but there's a, there's a patient, there's a family, they're under stress, they don't have a job, somebody's sick. And, and safety net hospitals are there to help. Um, they are fully integrated systems. They had to be. Uh, I think the reimbursement um, challenges that safety net hospitals face result in many of us becoming more adaptable and flexible. Many of own and operate health plans, as you'll hear later. Uh, they have a community face. They're focused on, 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 on delivering care to the communities they serve, often in those communities. Um, they're, often, they're often affiliated with high quality medical schools, as, as Boston Medical Center is privileged to be, or, and, and, with, and almost all of them have teaching programs, even if they don't have a medical school on site. They operate their health plans. They do provide major trauma. They often have other unique specialty programs that are really driven off of the demands of the patients that they serve. And they are, and this is really important, major employers in their communities. Now the weaknesses are kind of obvious. You don't get paid. It's hard to generate a margin. It's hard to recapitalize yourself. You'll have a weaker balance sheet. Um, you often share your faculty with your competitors, which is an interesting question. That's not necessarily the case at Boston Medical Center, but there are universities that have a, a safety net hospital that is their teaching program, and then the hospital across the street that everybody else wants to go to. Um, they have limited research enterprises. Again, we have a, a broader research base here at BMC, but um, often that research is, is community focused, and I think there's things we can learn from, the, from that kind of scholarship. And they are in complex, challenging environments. That's kind of code for sometimes bad neighborhoods. <laughs> but, <laughs> Um, you know, I put this up even though I kind of dog Denver Health's tagline because if people say to me, so Kate, what's your vision? And I'm getting actually a little tired of that question because I don't have a great answer. But I think if I look at, at safety net hospitals around the country and I, and I look at Denver Health, which um, it, Denver's a city of about 600,000, much like, Bos like Boston is. Um, they are the largest provider of uninsured or underinsured patients, in Medicaid and underinsured patients in Colorado. Um, uh, BMC is the largest provider of care for, to Medicaid patients in Massachusetts. 
they own a health plan, they are an integrated system of care with their federally qualified community health centers, um, and they have sophisticated health IT across the campus. Check, check, check. BMC is, for the first top bullets, are exactly where, uh, you know, kind of, kind of lines up directly with, with, uh, with Denver Health. Uh, they have, we have not at Boston Medical Center successfully applied lean strategies across the organization. At any point in time at Denver Health, there are 200 teams on, on the ground trying to make that place better in every single way from, from patient registrations to, to um, ventilator assisted pneumonias in the, uh, ven ven ventilator assisted or acquired pneumonias, VAP. Acquired pneumonia, VAP. <laughs> you don't want to assist pneumonia. Um, acquired uh, pneumonia is in the ICU. When, you, when you're in their ICU, you walk through and there's like charts on the wall right where patients and families can see them about how they're doing against VAP. It's actually very interesting. And there are very, as a result, because of all of this attention on quality and, um, and safety, they are a very high performer in UHC, Universal, University Hospital Compare Program. So when people say, who do you want to be? I'd like to be as good as Denver Health. Um, so I wanted to shift gears for a minute and talk a little bit about about sort of what what the fa what 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 uh, healthcare reform will mean to safety net hospitals, and I think there's some conventional wisdom that says, "Whoa, this is going to be a bad time for safety net hospitals." Despite the fact that our safety net patients are the newly insured, people are going to be competing for them. There'll be fewer hospitals as this market shakes out. Um, there'll be probably less need for people to be in hospital beds. So this is going to be a very tough time. And, and if you have insurance, you, if you have access to wherever you want to go, why would you come to a safety net hospital? So the people who say, you know, this is going to be a very tough time for public hospitals. And I think that may be sort of conventional wisdom. Um, the unconventional wisdom, or Kate's wisdom, or Kate's lack of wisdom, would suggest that, that in fact, it's going to be a great day for, for safety net hospitals. And I think that, that, um, that, that access really will be um, an important opportunity for the hospitals and the pa for safety net hospitals like Boston Medical Center and the people we serve. Um, you know, we are, we'll, we'll need to be funded. This transition, you know, will, will be challenging for us, but it'll be challenging for everybody. But I think that if we, if, if we can take as good care of patients as we possibly can, and we've seen this at Boston Medical Center, I believe that the services that we wrap around the, the care we deliver will actually end up resulting in a, a lower cost, higher quality product that people like Andrew will want to buy. Because I think, the, uh, I think that the safety net puts the patient kind of at the center of the care paradigm and has been doing it forever. I think we've been a medical home before that became fashionable. And I, do, and I, and I think that we will, uh, that if we do this right, we'll be, it will be a very good couple of years for safety net facilities. Either way, there's going to be a lot of changes. And I think we've seen that in Massachusetts, and part of the challenges that BMC faces is that those, those changes have occurred a little bit more rapidly and dramatically than, than we would have expected. Um, they'll con we also know that, that, that even with access for all, that the uninsured will largely flock, continue to flock to safety net hospitals. And the example of that is there's less than f there are fewer than 3% of the patients in Massachusetts who are uninsured. There's about 12% of uninsured on our campus today. So that, at, so that these numbers nationally um, kind of wash out, but they, they will very specifically affect safety net hospitals in very dramatic ways. Um, the last bullet that's really important, this has already happened in Massachusetts, disproportionate share payments or the extra payments that hospitals like BMC got were, are removed from the federal legislation. They were removed immediately um, in Massachusetts, which has created great problems on this campus, which you'll see in an upcoming slide. I think the federal legislation envisions half of the dish payments taken and not till 2017, and I think there's some of that language the secretary shall um, <laughs> around that, around that dish payment. But that, uh, uh, safety and hospitals around the country are watching dish payments and largely because of the experiences we've had here in Massachusetts. Um, we know that either way, um, and we've already seen this in Massachusetts, that, that there, are, there are significant implications for health care reform. Andrew alluded to reductions in Medicare payments, which will cause a whole lot of havoc in this industry, because if you walk through a hospital and you look at people in beds, by and large, they're old. So I think when you start thinking about uh, what health care reform means, you have to look at the Medicare budget and the implication, implications for hospitals. Um, the dish payments that we, that, we, uh, that we start receiving at BMC will, will continue to challenge, will challenge other hospitals. Coverage is going to be not much, not, not much difference, obviously, in Massachusetts, so I won't spend a lot of time belaboring that. But I do believe the Boston Medical Center will be very well positioned in this new world, largely because we are prepared to accept global, global payments, because we do think we can become an accountable care organization, whatever that means. And we've already built much of the, uh, much of the medical home infrastructure. 
But this is a bit of an eye chart, so let me, uh, but, we've, but we've got to get paid for the work we do. So let me um, see if I can decode this. On, this on, the, on your left are the number of unduplicated low-income patients at Boston Medical Center. The blue bar is Medicaid, and the green bar is uninsured. This, uh, this was uh, pre-healthcare reform in Massachusetts. And as you can see, as the time, this is FY10 on the far right, and you can see that the Medicaid patients, the, the Commonwealth care patients, and the uninsured are about the same where they were before. Our costs rose um, in a way that probably is not um, not perfect from a healthcare policy perspective, but not extraordinary if you look at other institutions around the co country, but our payments drop precipitously. So the challenge that BMC has right now is this gap between our costs and, this and what we're getting paid. And because our patients have pretty much stayed flat, the only thing that's changed is how they get insured, our new, newly duplicated patients. Our volume continues to grow on this campus, so one of the things we need to think about is if, our, if the number of newly insured, if the number of low, unduplicated low-income patients is about the same, why is our volume up every year? Are we doing more? Are the patients sicker? Or you know, are we attracting other patients? Or is there a utilization issue buried in this graph that we have to sort of tease out? But this gap between what we get paid and what, we, what it costs us to deliver the care is what's challenging on our campus right now. And we've got developed a number of strategies to deal with this. We've got to move this blue line down, and we've got to move this red line up. It's pretty simple. <laughs> I'm glad that got a laugh. Some days it doesn't. But <laughs> it doesn't really with the board. I don't know. <laughs> Um, and I, I, as I think about this, I think the real way out of this is Boston Medical Center to not sort of think about itself as a hospital, but think of itself as a health system. And I think our health plan is a great example of how, uh, where we can learn a lot about that difference in care and the differences in utilization that are driving some of our costs. And we have a great health plan. It's a Medicaid managed care plan. It runs statewide. We have about 250,000 members, and we're pretty highly ranked. We've got good administrative costs under 6%, which I think is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty benchmark, as Andrew will tell you. And I think there's a lot we can learn from this health plan and that this health plan can kind of provide business and clinical literacy so that we can, we can work on the cost challenges we face. I'm also very proud of, of the relationship that Boston Medical Center has with 15 community health centers. These guys have got to be part of the solution. There is really no reason for pa patients to come to our, to our campus for care that they can get right in their neighborhood that will be culturally sensitive, that will be, that will be, a, that will be appropriate for the, for the work they do, and will just be much more accessible over time. And I think that the combination of our health plan, our health centers, the fact that we're a, a large, you know, we're a full service academic medical center, but we're not trying to fill a thousand beds. You know, Bob mentioned in his introduction that we have 629 beds. We actually keep about 500 beds open. The, um, the last 129 go back to a chronic care hospital that, we're, that, that are hanging out on our, on our license for reasons that aren't completely clear to me, but, but I will find out. Um, but, but I, you know, I, I think the, um, the size of the hospital, we can treat just about everyone. We send out very coordinary stuff, but most of what, what would, would ail you or ail your families, we can care for on, on our campus. Um, we, as I said, the health, the, health plan, the health plan helps us understand what it does, how, how we can care for the, a population of Medicaid patients, where they utilize services, um, the interplay between, you know, everybody thinks it's emergency room utilization that drives the cost in our patient population. In fact, it's probably behavioral health, and understanding that conundrum will be very useful to us going forward. Um, you know, and we, we do a great job caring for patients. You know, this exceptional care without exception is something that I think motivates people to change. It motivates people to make sure that we get this right so that we can continue to preserve the mission. You know, I tell, I'm fond of telling people there are many, many ways to make sure that we preserve this mission. It's not only just, take, just doing more. And in fact, doing less may be the best way to do that. So what have we learned? Uh, you know, everyone talks about an accountable care organization. I've come to the conclusion that whoever you are, you're an accountable care organization. The health centers tell me they're accountable care organizations. I say we're accountable care organizations. There's some guy on YouTube who says he's an accountable care organization. So uh, I think it's uh, I think it's pretty clear that it's whoever you want to be. So. Um, and I do think that the revenue is going to be slow to catch up with the rhetoric and organizations like mine that start with, with, with from a challenging standpoint or, or other safety net hospitals around the country that have weaker balance sheets. It's going to be a, a tough time for us. We've got to keep our eye on what I believe are precious community resources. 
And I also think that payment reform is really important, and it's absolutely necessary, but it's not sufficient. I think of payment reform happening up here, but if we don't fix the individual patient encounter, what happens in a bed, what happens in a clinic, sort of what happens in these practices, payment reform will just end up kind of pissing everybody off. We've got to figure out a way to get this right. The work that, you know, what, what, the fact that your patients are 94 years old and no one's had an end of life discussion happened in my own family. I mean, it's, uh, you know, everyone's kind of looking around who's the healthcare proxy. There's seven of us. Someone should have figured that out. I mean, <laughs> but um, I think the, um, and so, so it's my, so we have to re reform payment, but we also have to reform and change and redirect how we care for patients. And one of the reasons I'm so excited to be on this campus is I think we have to think about how we train clinicians. What's important to, uh, to, to, uh, to medical students? What do nursing students learn? What do physical therapy students learn? And I think being, being in a campus that's privileged to share its grass with a public health school, with a, with a dental school, with a medical school, I think creates a real opportunity at Boston Medical Center to be a learning lab. Um, everyone's talked about this, but, th but this begins and will end if we don't get this health IT stuff right. We have tons of data. We have still uh, very little information. The kind of charts that Andrew's put up, every physician, every nurse, every hospital administrator needs to be looking at all day long. And that's one of the things that Patty Gabao at Denver Health does so well. And then I think, um, to Alice's point, if we get this right, if we help providers understand how they can take better care of their patients, we will transform the system because that's why people are here. And I think it really will be, uh, uh, it really, I think it will be challenging. It won't be as fast as Andrew predicts. Hopefully it won't be as long as David suggests, but I think it will be a very interesting, exciting time in healthcare. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kate. Well, uh, Boston University School of Public Health is a audience care organization. <laughs> so we're going to care for our audience by taking a 10-minute break. We'll start promptly at 11, at which time we will become an audience collaboration organization and let you uh, ask questions of the panelists. So please, back here at 11 for some give and take. Thank you. Um, as we mentioned, the, um, the proceedings are being videoed. Uh, we'll be, end, I'm sure, up on the BU, uh, B universe at some point. Um, and so to ensure a good recording of your question, please go to a microphone, which are actually, despite common practice, in the back of the room today. Um, well, let me again thank our speakers for, uh, for their comments. Um, let, me, let me start by asking a question, and I suppose it's posed more to David than to others, but anybody can jump in. I'm struck by your focus on value and your list of people who have made money uh, in healthcare, and, and particularly your last point about how, um, you know, in a sense, improving the system could be transformative. Um, you know, if you take the retailers and so forth. It strikes me that you're here at a school of public health where I think a show of hands would say that, you know, probably 90 plus percent of the students and faculty would support universal uh, coverage. Um, and probably a large percentage have some queasiness about making money off of sick patients. And here you are in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which is almost unique in terms of its almost strict reliance on not-for-profit health care to the point when Cerebrus buys Caris Christie, everybody starts to get hives. Mm -hmm. um, is, is our not-for-profit approach um, anachronistic? Is it going to be a major barrier for Massachusetts? Um, we've led health care transformation with Chapter 508. Are we now in a disadvantaged position, and how, how do we change that? Um. Well, thank, thanks for, for the question. Um, I don't think we're in a bad position, uh, but I think, and it comes back to something that, that Kate Walsh was saying, the, the key issue, so there are two key issues. One is figuring out how to manage the institutions. 
you know, so everyone here agreed that 25% of hospital costs don't need to happen. Um, how do we get, re how, do you, how do you run things more efficiently? The example that Kate gave, a lot of the other examples around the country are actually not-for-profit hospitals that figure out how to run them better. And because the key is not so much the profit incentive, the key is do you feel like you're doing the right thing? Mm. And do the employees feel like they're really a part of it? That is, are, do they really have ownership? And those are more important than the for-profit. I mean, if you look at the most successful for-profit companies, they're companies that people enjoy working at. They're not sort of ruthless, you do this or you, 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 you do that. So, so in terms of actually running the institutions, what's going to be much more important than are you for-profit or not is do you get all the ingredients there and do you really have the motivated workers and customers to help you out? And similarly, in terms of kind of managing the patients better, it's again the same sort of thing. It's have you provided the tools and have you freed up the people and enabled them to, to do it? And so I don't think the profit orientation is going to matter. And I think, you know, y y if you go to not-for-profit institutions across the country, some of the employees are depressed. <coughs> if you go to for-profit institutions, some of them are depressed. It's really an issue about the organization of what's going on more than it is the nominal ownership structure. Okay. Other panelists? Andrew, uh, leading the largest not-for-profit right. insurer? No, I, I, well, I mean, I, I like our not-for-profit tradition in Massachusetts, and I think because the organizations are also committed to their community and that there's a sense of community ownership. But I agree with David, there are uh, innovation, which is really what we're talking about, and efficiency can exist regardless of tax status. Okay. I, I think transparency is a really in key ingredient and I think in order to get better transparency there has to be a cultural change within hospitals, within the uh, total structure from governing bodies all the way down. And I just daydream, daydream about profit so I'm <laughs> <laughs> Questions, please. They're black, sometimes they're red. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Um, it's very clear that there are going to be a lot of folks left out of our near universal um, health care reform. Um, and the question comes up, what's going to happen to them? What's going to happen to people who are um, illegal residents, uh, illegal aliens? what's going to happen to people who are going to end up grossly um, underinsured. Um, in the past, there were government programs like the Breast and Cervical Cancer Screening Initiative that were targeted not just at the uninsured, but the underinsured. But I think there's a plan to eliminate all those programs. What are we going to do? Can I take that? I, I think we're going to... I think we'll keep taking care of folks, and I think when I talked about wraparound social services, screening, access to, you know, Saturday mammography hours, all the things that we've been doing at, at Boston Medical Center, we're going to keep doing. So I don't, I think that those patients will continue to get care. I think the, what's unanswered is who pays for it. I think the other issue is for Antala provisions, they will get emergency care, ambulatory care in the emergency room. Uh, the problem will come in terms of their maintenance and preventive care. I think there will be compromises for um, the persons you described in those categories. Um, the Massachusetts experience does suggest there are 97% um, of the population is covered, so there are 3% uncovered, and as you suggest, there are some vulnerable groups that have been left out. But um, there's also been, as part of the federal bill, a huge commitment, financial commitment to community health centers. Yeah. And I think community health centers will become even more mm -hmm. important as a source of care. And back to um, Bob's original question, they sometimes can provide high quality, efficient care outside of our larger kind of industrial health care system. Just one, one thing to add, which is that um, as we cut back on the utilization of services that aren't needed or that we learn we don't need. What I hope and trust that we'll do is pay higher rates for those services that we actually do need, particularly for primary care, but also for critical care, particularly at safety net hospitals. So my hope is that the, even if we've cut back on the formal program, 
that says this money pays for this will have made it up in other ways by saying look we're going to make we're going to make it worth your while to have streamlined and made more efficient the care you receive you provide okay. provost antman the new health care legislation says that the medical care dollar has to be at least 80 percent of the total dollars that's a 20 percent overhead rate how do we get that down uh, medic let's see uh, the VA is about two percent Medicare is about five percent most other countries are in the range of two to five why are we at 20 or more uh, well uh, first of all it's it's a great question in Massachusetts we're at well we're supposed to be at 10 we're actually more at nine or eight which is why Blue Cross has been losing money for the last few years um, and so in fact state legislation passed um, requiring health plans within two years to be at 90 percent um, what I think also may be behind your question, I know because having spoken with you between and the break, is that even though 90 cents of every dollar the Blue Cross collects in premiums go back out to pay for care, our administrative requirements cause a lot of administrative spending in the delivery system. So within that 90 cents, there's a lot of wasted administrative dollars. David spoke, we've been talking more about wasted clinical dollars. And I think we, we need to um, fundamentally simplify the administration of our healthcare system so that it's easier for physicians and hospitals and other care providers to thrive. I, 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 I want to echo that and just say that um, I, I think the lack of focus on that was actually a very big missed opportunity in reform. Not that you need the reform legislation to do it, but one way to signal to physicians and patients that you were serious about reform would have been to say forcefully take that issue head on I think now we should take it head on but mm -hmm. it, it, it would have benefited from more attention and the only thing I would add is it's it's easy and it's convenient and sometimes I do it to say that all of the uh, administrative waste comes from the payer side but there's ways hospitals organize themselves there's um you know there's still a bit of a guild mentality if you know the best example and, and they've improved their practices dramatically is the Joint Commission where you know you have pharmacists writing rules about how specifically mm -hmm. pharmacy you know I mean think mm -hmm. I mean it, so I, I think that there's a there's a, a lot of uh, shall we say opportunity and it's not just between payer and provider but even within within providers I'd like to know how we can retrieve the debate in the public and political realms about health care. Um, as a statistician and marketer, when I think of quality, I certainly don't think of the ethereal and undefinable. I think of Deming and Duran, and when I think of value, I think of what am I getting for what I'm giving. That's not the popular idiom. And the challenge I think we have as practitioners, academicians, payers, etc is to retrieve the, the priority, retrieve the high ground in the public dialogue about this issue. And if we ignore that, we will be doomed to these halls to having interesting internal discussions with uh, great intentions, but nothing produced. I completely agree with that and the only thing I'd add is that I, I think it's not just the quality debate which I've thought a lot about but it's also the affordability question and I actually think we need to redefine the terms of the debate I don't know if it's just re retrieve it it's redefine it because if you ask uh, members of the public about to define quality they they can't um, and secondly if you ask them about about care they still believe that more is always better and what we've heard a lot about today is more is not always better. Better is better, and that sometimes is more, sometimes less, sometimes it's different. And um, it's going to take a lot of work because right now, the healthcare is defined as, as an individual activity, not as a collective societal activity. And until we do that, and I say that in a school of public health, it's, it's very important to do. Can, can I just add one point? I also think the political discourse needs to be reframed because I, I believe this health care cost or productivity issue for this country, I don't understand why the why this isn't a Republican issue if you want to be. I mean, if, if people really care about small businesses, I mean, you know, the Herald gets it right, small biz ills or whatever your right. your headline was. I, and and I, I don't understand how this 
dialogue got so far off track. And I think the best example of that was sort of uh, sort of the you know the the death panel cul-de-sac pe- people wandered into, um, which resulted in hospice funding getting cut. I mean, think about it. Maybe not. No, 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 no. I wanted to be on the death panels. So I thought that was my. my <laughs> 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 that was my that was that was that <laughs> only if you get to pick. Yeah, exactly. Uh, just think of all the fun I could <laughs> have. David, you could handle those end of life discussions. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Doctor Kavorkin is your primary care physician. <laughs> um, um, lest we think it's all in the public, I, I, I've had a very disturbing conversation with quite a number of hospital CEOs where I say something like, you know tell me about your rate of hospital acquired infections. And they'll say, you know, we're very good. We're at 4% or 3% or whatever the ratio is. It's something. And I say, you know, there are places like Pittsburgh that are at 0%. How come you haven't figured out how to get? Well, it's just not technically possible for us to get there. But we know that there are places that are big and complex and Mm -hmm. all of that that have basically got. And so there's this sort of denial, even among the sophisticated at some times, that you can actually do this. Now, to be fair to the public, I think the public sort of, once we got past the death panels and we got back into, don't you think you should have the kind of care you get in the Mayo Clinic? People said yes, and if they can deliver it there, then why can't I have it here? But uh, but we, we, it's going to be a challenge all over, not just in the kind of keeping the public eyes focused. Yeah, I, I actually will own up to this. I heard I was on a, a panel or I said in a meeting where a guy from Kings County in New- oh sorry a guy from Kings County in New York was telling um, was telling us that his he'd driven his VAP rates to zero in the unit and I was like he's lying <laughs> you know <laughs> instead of thinking wow how do you do it my first thought was he's making it up you know I'm not proud of that what's that word uh, VAP yeah, no, Vil- no, ventilator no, acquired ha- ha- pneumonia. Ha- 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 uh, hematia. Hematia. That was my hematia moment. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Bicknell. Um, thanks, Bob. Very energizing mor- uh, morning. Thank you. The <coughs> just an aside and then a question. It's just interesting. Uh, there's been no mention of nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants, etc. And it seems, you know, with uh, restructuring different roles, more efficiency, there may or may not be something there. My question has to do with medical students and medical school debt. I'm on the med school admissions committee. Um, The kids, the students, particularly students come in with a real social conscience and orientation, but then by the time the combination of debt they leave with, debt they've come up with from undergraduate school, and then the choices they have to make, and especially how would you, do you think there's anything to the fact that medical school debt uh, influences uh, uh, specialty choice, and if you do think that, uh, what might be done about that uh, going forward, and even to some extent retroactively? So um, I think uh, medical school debt does make a difference, and we've seen that even within our medical student section of the Mass Medical Society. Uh, we are actually in the process and have, we actually have passed a resolution to look into how we can help with uh, loan repayment, but at the level of residency completion. And, um, you know, because uh, we want to be able to increase the primary care workforce that actually is practicing in Massachusetts. Whereas you help loan debts at the medical student level, it is not necessarily that they will come and actually practice primary care in the state. So, uh, but there's, uh, there are others who have uh, recognized that UMass, uh, as a part of their admission process, uh, look very closely at the number of primary care, uh, the, the primary care interests uh, expressed by the medical students. So medical s- schools, some medical schools specifically, are actually designed for primary care. The new medical schools that are actually a part of the AAMC's goal to increase the number of slots by 30%, some of the new medical schools are geared specifically for primary care. Um, of medical students going into primary care. Um, Just on on your first point, most of my family's care for the last 20 years has been provided by nurse practitioners and it's been spectacular. So I I think they're critical to the system. I think uh, we have to move beyond loan repayment. We have to get to the income disparity. And it's just, it's so substantial. And I would suggest that the best way to do that is by changing the method of pay. We, We so more highly value proceduralists today than we do cognitive skills and we have to change that and we have to rebalance it and it's going to take a generation but we have to get started now 
And I, I was at the International Workforce Conference in Edinburgh uh, two years ago, and uh, the internists uh, in the UK make between 90 and 180 pounds. They call them generalists which is, uh, you know, considerable mu much more when you do the conversion from pounds to dollars than a primary care internist or family practitioner makes here. Okay. Next question. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, I, I work at a nonprofit holistic wellness center, so I'm wondering what role, if any, complementary and alternative medicine plays in the shift to accountable care organizations or Mr. Dreyfus's new um, alternative payment right. process. Acupuncture is rather cheap in uh, treatment and the clinical outcomes are very positive in a lot of situations. Well, Andrew, is that what you meant by an alternative care organization? Right, right. Um, <laughs> ears perked up. I got really right, excited about um, that. <laughs> well, when, when you look at patient preferences and where people spend their out-of-pocket spending, it's uh, huge in complementary medicine. And I think if when, we're, when organizations get focused on outcomes and on, and on positive patient experience, and by the way, we're paying better if you have better patient experience, we're paying better if you have better outcomes, then I think we'll see these practices, whether they be hospitals or physician practices, start to bring in more alternative therapy. And the evidence on, on common issues like low back pain, for example, which is one David cited, um, is just so overwhelming that non-physician specialists, whether, from, whether they be chiropractors, or acupuncturists, or other, other specialists, often have as good or better outcome at a fraction of the cost. brings up the kind of data issue in the sense that very few organizations have done the analysis to say, how do we get better outcomes with this? And that's one of the things, hopefully we'll be able to aggregate a lot of this data and say, look, you know, here's an organization that uses MRIs and orthopedists to deal with lower back pain. Here's one that uses physical therapists and acupuncture, you know, more or less the patient mix is about the same. Look where the patients go back to work faster. Look where the costs are cheaper. Look where the patients are happier. We'll just lay it all out for you. And by the way, you have a good financial incentive for figuring out the best way to do it. We're running a pilot project right now with an insurance company about cost efficacy and ER visits and medications yeah. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there, there was a big um, pilot uh, in the Seattle area between the Virginia Mason Hospital and a Boeing as an employer and a local health plan around back pain. And what they discovered is they were able to get people back to work much quicker. So the hospital lost a lot of money yeah. because they weren't do ordering all the MRIs and performing the surgery. So they ha we have to find a way to reimburse the healthcare providers in a way that's reasonable um, when they start to integrate more complementary uh, interventions. Professor Glantz. I'm Leonard Glantz. I'm in the health law. Uh, department at the School of Public Health. Um, and I used to be on the board of the Urban Medical Group, um, which was a not-for-profit inner city um, group of private doctors um, who were able to prove that if they got capitated, they could save money. Um, they used nurse practitioners, by the way, that was the answer to your question, yes. Professor Cutler, in order to do care. And they went bankrupt because nobody would actually provide them with capitation. They did no procedures. They saw that, you know, what was uh, their measure of success was their patients not going in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, they went bankrupt. But that's an aside. <laughs> well, um, well, and, and just in, on Urban Medical's behalf, having several members of my family um, were Urban Medical patients, they're now a part of the BI Deaconess Physician Organization. Sort of. Right, right. And, yes. and I, and, um, and the model that they developed that Bob Master what is now applying in other, in other settings is very successful. Right. So. But it was impossible to find anyone yeah. to actually pay for it, even though it was clear that documents could do it. Here's my question, actually, is aren't you really just moving the chairs around the Titanic? And that's how it seems to me, that, that the discussion here is assumed that the business model is actually the right model. I think the notion that this is like um, um, you know, Walmart is, 
is just not convincing in any way. If I, if I went to Walmart um, because my, my employer gave me insurance to go to Walmart and therefore I could buy stuff at Walmart only if it was okay with my employer who arranged with somebody else to tell me what I could buy at Walmart, um, it might be analogous in some way. When you talk about pediatricians not making any money, they're not making any money because that's like the market at work, right? The, you can get pediatricians for cheap, we'll pay them cheap. Right. It seems that, the, that you're no, when you put up that group of healthcare billionaires, it struck me as two things. One is that they're not in the healthcare business, right? They're in the tchotchke business. They don't provide, <laughs> they, don't see a, they don't see a patient, they don't deliver care, they don't examine anybody. They're no different than the people who make toilet paper, the people who make hospital beds, that all they do is supply stuff to there. And the fact that they're billionaires would indicate to me that we pay them too much. <laughs> right? That they shouldn't be billionaires. The notion that there's a healthcare billionaire to be made, like you know, the Walmart, strikes me as the problem, not the solution. That they shouldn't be healthcare billionaires. And that as long as we use this <coughs> market model, this business model, so Kate Walsh talks about her competitors. And of course they are her competitors in this current. But, and that's what's crazy. Right, that you can't actually have an integrated system. Kate Walsh, you know, every, every group has an integrated system. And since they all have integrated systems, it's not an integrated system, right? By definition, you know, why does every hospital do heart surgery? Why does every hospital have CAT scan machines? Why does every hospital do that? And until we deal with, it seems to me, those fundamental issues that markets say it's for me, um, that it can't change. You know, nothing that was said about the healthcare system today is different than what was said 30 years ago. That is, fee for service is expensive. If you pay doctors to do things, it's the um, George Bernard Shaw thing, they'll do them. That an empty bed is a bed that'll be used, a new bed is I mean, we know all that stuff. So if it's such a good idea, why hasn't it happened? <laughs> well, uh, well, first, I'd like to say a, a couple things in response to what's different about this with capitation. Um, one thing is that this cannot be isolated from quality. It cannot. And a piece of us looking at uh, this whole notion of global payment and global budget cannot be the old-fashioned capitation. It has to include some payment for performance and has to include risk adjustments. Otherwise, you develop into possibly a two-tier system where there are sicker patients who get less care. Um, just by the nature of the fact that they have a hard time accessing the system and the physicians caring for them are not reimbursed for the extra time that's necessary to coordinate care. So what does it do? If you have a limited it, global payment kind of picture, it forces physicians and providers and people within the system to look at how they can become more efficient. Uh, the emergency visits um, in this state uh, are little, uh, result in over uh, half a billion dollars. Of that, we looked at that on the payment reform, a quarter of a million dollars, a quarter of a billion dollars is actually spent on avoidable, preventable admissions. And these are things that if they were coordinated could result in that much savings. So you cannot just implement global payment without some quality measures and quality does make a difference in terms of cost. Is, um, I think I'm less cynical about the product that that uh, that a health system produces than maybe you are, and and definitely less cynical than you are. I, I mean, I think, uh, no, and and I and I really do think that there's uh, something about uh, there's something very special about when when providers, patients, people who are trying to innovate and create new knowledge, uh, whether it's scientific knowledge, whether it's how we care for people, that is absolutely incredibly special and I think we do you know people are alive because somebody thought gee is there a better way to do this and I think as long as we continue to create an environment where that can continue it, you, admittedly in a messy less than elegant way I, I mean I'm sort of I'm sort of up for the fight I, you know I don't think that it's it's uh, because I, I believe in what it is we fundamentally do and I think there is a difference when you walk into a Walmart you're not scared I mean, you might be scared that you can't find your way out, but I mean, but 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 when you when you're coming to 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 mm -hmm. when you know, when her family coming in to see somebody in Alice's ICU, you know, it, I think it's a different transaction, and I think the value mm -hmm. equation's more complicated. 
I guess I, the one thing I'd offer is I, I thought underlying your question was what is the is there a role and what should be the appropriate role of competition and markets in healthcare, and right now we actually have a blended system. About half of all the payments that these hospitals and physicians receive come from government, and they're they're regulated, they're administered prices, and so the question really is: so we have a blended system now, mm. and I think the question is what kind of blend is appropriate, and I think the. The experience in Western Europe is that we've tried all sorts of different systems, and it's very interesting in the UK, because I also came from a recent meeting in the UK. They're trying to introduce much more market incentives into their system to make it more efficient. And so I, I, I actually am pretty optimistic that we're not just replaying the same tape again, that we're doing things differently, that we can learn from the past, and that some appropriate blend of a lot of government oversight, which we have today and we're going to have more of as, as a result of federal reform, with appropriate incentives can give us a, a better system for, for patients. Let me just add one quick thing. Um, the, I think the, there's, there are many advantages of being bigger, including the ability to coordinate. And there's another advantage, which is the bigger any organization is, the more it necessarily has to think about the community. So when you're just at one small hospital or one small physician group, look, the community's problems are not my problems. When you are the whole community, then of necessity you have to start thinking, what am I doing for Roxbury and Dorchester and Mattapan and all? And that's just in your blood. And I, 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 I'm not sure I know this. I'd be curious to know what is the, how much money does partners have relative to the public health department of Massachusetts? And in fact, is real, should we really be viewing partners as the public health organization Wow. or demanding more of it as a public health organization than we do because of disparities in, in revenues. Mm. Over here. Hi. Um, my question has to do with something that all of you actually touched on, but no one really went into specifics about how to address it. Uh, the issue with using data and improving improvement of IT services. Uh, for instance, one of the hospitals that I work at uh, we have over six different programs, none of which necessarily talk to each other. Uh, and then within the Boston area, one ED can't necessarily, I just gave it away, but one ED can't necessarily talk to another ED, which can't talk to another. I have family in Cleveland that works at the Cleveland Clinic. They're in a bad place. In Maryland, there's hospitals that are still on paper. Um, Mr. Dreyfus had a beautiful graph that, that of the, um, the endoscopy with biopsy, I think. Yeah. But I'm just curious, how did you get that graph? Because the data is all over the place. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is our data is not. So one of the one of the resources that health plans have is that we have this very rich claims data, which in the past we've not been very good about translating into information, as, as someone else mm -hmm. said. I, the question of the interoperability of patient records is very, very important. And we actually are making some real progress on that in Greater Boston. And I've experienced my father, who was a Brigham patient one day, Brigham was on diversion, had to go to the BI for emergency room. They had no record. They could practically shout his, his medical results from one hospital to the other, but we couldn't get them. On the other hand, it's been interesting because Atrius, one of the big practices, is now um, has some affiliations with the... Um, with with the BI and there's now a button on the Atrius uh, in the Atrius terminal, which the doctors, physicians here called the magic button, because they just hit that button and they're immediately connected to the patient site at the BI. It can be done. We just we have to break down these institutional barriers. You know, the ironic thing is those two hospital systems grew up out of the same computer system. They were actually one to start with, and then they kind of diverged, and no one ever thought. No one ever wanted to put resources into making them link again, but it's technically not that hard at all. I, I would only add that on the ground, having been at a number of these hospitals, when decisions around different IT systems are made, uh, the uh, cottage industry roots of hospitals kind of show up in those decisions. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the, the ICU docs want certain information and will fight to the death to get it, and will fight for their system to be different than, because it's better than, um, than the one that the ED docs use. And then the people on the back end are trying to, you know, reintegrate all this information, and that cre creates a cost associated with it. So we've, we haven't been as, uh, as, uh, as scientific about it. We've been much more artistic, and we're paying the price. Uh, I can say that we met with the 
uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, <coughs> Judy Ann Biggie, specifically about the issue of uh, EHR, and they're coming out with a certified vendor list um, that uh, providers can look at to see which kind of EHR would uh, best fit their practice, but more importantly, to deal with the issue of interoperability. Um, uh, I have a question about the uh, the application of the concepts of uh, of quality and, and efficiency, you know, in healthcare. Um, often told as a physician, I'm supposed to be like an airline pilot who you know navigates through any storm and, and lands the plane perfectly every time. I guess now I'm supposed to be like Best Buy or Walmart with uh, you know minimizing excess capacity and and just in time inventory delivery and and things of that sort. I, I was I was very interested to see um, Mr. Frist's name on the on the list of the 11 most wealthy uh, people in healthcare because you know Columbia HCA one of the ways that they made their money was by decreasing excess capacity, closing down hospital beds, and then. Uh, when a large hurricane hit the eastern seaboard and there was no surge capacity, plenty of people were, were left without uh, hospital beds to occupy. Um, if I go to Walmart and I want a toaster oven and it hasn't been delivered yet, I go to another store or I come back the next day. If I go to the emergency department with a heart attack and I need a cardiac surgeon and there isn't one, um, I die. And, and maybe that's okay, but there needs to be a conversation about what the expectations are of the healthcare system where um, if, if we're asking um, people to operate near capacity to minimize waste, uh, and then Dr. Coombs throws up a graph that shows most of the ER visits are between 9 and 5 when those doctors are very busy in their offices and have no excess surge capacity to take care of patients who have easily preventable ER visits, uh, but that's the only way that they can keep the lights on because their overhead is 60 percent because they have all these administrative and, and regulatory uh, requirements that necessitate people who aren't doctors uh, who are at the, the leading edge of that graph to fulfill. Um, you know, it, 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 it's sort of hard to see where, how we get there from here in terms of the fundamental restructuring of the system because as a physician I would love to spend all my time in a room with my patients, talking to them, hearing about their problems and, and fixing them and, and, and not having to um, send people to the ER because I didn't have the time to squeeze one more patient into my schedule or you know, not ordering a test because the patient had the expectation that they wanted the test and, and, and they're not cost sensitive because the copay is 25 bucks even though the MRI costs $1,000. Um, it, you know, the people respond to incentives and, and, and the patients aren't um, necessary. I mean, they're becoming more cost sensitive with high deductible health plans and co-pays, but, um, but there needs to be a public understanding as well. Um, another, you know, in terms of how you define waste, um, uh, Rahm Emanuel's older brother uh, wrote an interesting paper, I think it was in 1994, about 40 percent of Medicare payments going to be spent in the last six months of life. So it'd be great if we could get rid of those 40 percent of Medicare payments, but how to prospectively identify what, what waste is. Um, we know maybe in back surgery, arthroscopic surgery, things like that, that there are more effective, more cost effective strategies, but it, it, it's a very complex uh, situation when you try to drill down, and especially with one person's waste is another person's income. Um, so, so with so many people sort of fighting in the sandbox, uh, you know, with, with the short time horizon that we have, it, it, it's hard to see um, how we end up with a, with a unified system that works for, for everybody involved. I think we just heard the doctor's dilemma circa 2010. <laughs> <laughs> that, was <a> that was a recruiting pitch for medical school, I think. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually work with that individual in the <coughs> ICU. That's Matt. <laughs> Thank you, Matt, for the question. And I think uh, one of the concerns we had on the Payment Reform Commission is looking at the capacitance and also the resources that are kind of created in areas where obviously there are already resources and duplication of services. So it's almost like there's, there is maldistribution, and we know that we have the 128 loop factor. Within the 128, it's a, it's a rich technologically resource in terms of uh, specialization and things of that nature. But there almost uh, needs to be a planning of in terms of uh, what happens in terms of social accountability for the the residents of Massachusetts that are out in the trenches, especially Western Massachusetts and places like that. So I think that's that needs to be a discussion as well. I just make. Um two observations, related observations. One is, uh, I think as Matt s said, 
actually managing what happens in healthcare is probably the most complicated industry of any industry in the economy. As you said, it's far more complicated than Walmart and Target, even far more complicated than flying an airplane. And I think there's probably a little bit of blame to go around to say business schools that have not trained people with any ability to manage in healthcare. And you know, a bit of the reverse flow that is until very recently, hospitals were not interested in finding people who knew how to manage mm -hmm. things. So, you, so it's, it's, it's hard to take the most complicated thing ever and figure out how to make it work. And it's interesting, you know, that Andrew gave the example of Virginia Mason in Seattle. The yeah. reason why they got on the, the, the sort of lean bandwagon is because they were sitting next, the CEO was sitting next to Boeing on the airplane the CEO of Boeing on the airplane. Mm -hmm. And so what you get is this sort of spillover from manufacturing in areas where that occurs, and that's where you can get, get, get some of that. A and so I, I, I think there's, there's pro there probably some of that spillover needs to happen. But the, the, you know, another feature of a lot of these, a lot of good management is you don't ask people to do something they're not capable of doing. And if you go to the, take, think about a physician, what a physician is really great at is being a doctor. And what we need to do is free up the physician to be a doctor and to have someone else do the stuff that's not doc, you know, f sort of figure out the right way to do it. Because otherwise, as Alice said, we will just completely overwhelm people. And as Matt said, we'll just completely overwhelm people by asking them to do something way out of their capacity that they don't enjoy and they're not trained for. If, if you haven't seen it this week uh, in the New England Journal, there's an article about Grand Junction, Colorado, which is not Boston, I understand, <coughs> but it was is one of the areas identified in the Dartmouth Atlas and others in terms of efficiency and quality. We have to rebuild the system and we have to start each physician and, and the experience we've had of sharing the data with physicians has really been incredible for them to really think about how can I care for my patients the way I want to, as it sounds like you want to, but in also a way that's efficient. And I do think we have to, um, you kind of alluded to it, give, we haven't talked much about today, giving patients better incentives. We pay $1,400 for an MRI in an academic medical center and $700 in a community setting. And we have to start exposing patients to that difference and asking them to engage in making some of those choices too. In, in one study in Wisconsin, they actually looked at spinal fusion surgeries and they compared three different hospitals' uh, costs. What they did to the patients is they said, these hospitals are very similar, comparable in terms of complications. And they gave the patients uh, a check for $1,500 if they chose the least expensive hospital. All these starving students are going to run out and try to get spinal So, uh, David, you and I have known each other a long time, and I'm going to um, really disagree with you on something and then I'm going to really agree with you on something. And I'm going to start with your words that you're using and going back to the very first thing that you said. Mm -hmm. And so you just a minute ago used the word uh, complicated and I fundamentally think that's the wrong word and I'll mm -hmm. tell you why. Um, I think the word is complex and to me the definition of the word complex, and it goes back to the first thing you said about being a model, um, a model uh, professor and the fact that um, uh, complicated systems are subject to modeling and that they mo are modeled well. That's the definition of a complicated. A complex system is defined as one that's, that's not amenable to modeling. And so as a result, um, it, uh, the language we use, and we're trying to transform the debate, um, I think that's a problem. And so you just used it again, and I've heard you do it before, and I'm not sure if I've said it to you before, but I wanted to, in this very public forum, <laughs> say that. that that's <laughs> Um, I so appreciate that. I'm sure you do. Um, secondly, so I want to say the positive thing. I will say that the innovation issue, and again, David has a great working paper, NBR working paper you all should read, and, uh, and it uh, addresses this, everything he said in greater detail, and, uh, and is really, and the innovation problem is really important, and how we address that, um, to me, um, the piece that, that you're right about the Walmart, so, the, so everybody's debating, everybody's laughing about Walmart, the Walmart issue, but it is the right answer. And here's a couple of the ways why, and I just wanted you to react to that. And maybe, you know, maybe you've been sitting here taking the laughs, but, um, but Walmart does a couple of things really well that we need to do. It's one of the things it does well is it pressures the suppliers. Walmart does a massively good job 
at making the rest of the world, and it is the world, um, kowtow to what it believes. Okay, so, so the reason Walmart has so many resources is because it does that, um, and it does that really well. Second thing it does is the patients, w or the, the customers walk in the door, and, they, and, and, and Walmart has correctly identified what it is they really, it's really patient-centered, it's really customer-centered. It's done both of those things really well. This is not rocket science. Everybody knows that. So, so what's the new uh, organization? What's the new type of provider that we need sitting on top of the healthcare system, telling everybody else what to do? And to me, I've said, and I've said this in many forums, and I had many tomatoes thrown at me, so I'm going to say it again, which is the type of person that is that's closest trained in our system is life coaching, social workers. And we need to have social workers sitting on top of the system that are the people that we do at these different levels you talked about. So I wanted you to react to both of those things, both my critical piece and the more positive piece. Thank you. Um, thank you. Just very quickly, I, I think you're right, although I, there are ways of managing for complexity. That is, in fact, there was work done here at BU that most hospitals think they'll never have an emergency surgery, and they plan that way, despite the fact that they have one or two a day and every day they're surprised by that. And so you can actually do a much better job just understanding that there are things that are, that are complex. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very interesting because you brought up the social workers and the earlier comment brought up complementary and alternative medicine and someone else brought up advanced practice nurses and nurse practitioners. And all of these are examples of providers that are, or, or care coordinators or healthcare workers who have been disenfranchised or disfavored, and all of whom ought to have a much more important role to play. And th everyone's hope on this panel is that we find some way, whatever it is through information and payment and all of that, where, that, where those people are a, a huge part of the equation, as big a part of the equation as they can be consistent with giving people what is what they want. Okay. Well, we uh, school of public health needs to be an accountable conclusion organization, and it's 1240, 11:45. Uh, so we'll take one more question. Um, sorry about that. I'm Vicky Chetty. I'm an economist in the Department of Family Medicine here. Uh, I think one uh, very distinct aspect of healthcare industry, I think, not mentioned very much here, is third-party payment. So everyone thinks, patient does not think that he's paying. The provider thinks that somebody else is paying. Therefore, let's be very safe, okay? So this third-party payment is a very distinct feature of the health services industry, and it has two problems. Uh, one, as I mentioned, uh, everybody thinks somebody else is paying. Another one, it leads to the insurance, path, uh, insurance aspect, and therefore few buyers. Uh, result uh, in Singapore, for instance, the, the the health services is split into two parts: catastrophic events and non-catastrophic. Non-catastrophic event is paid for completely by the purchasers, uh, patients themselves. So, so uh, thousands of uh, buyers, which definitely helps to improve efficiency and. Uh, direct involvement of purchases okay uh, i was i would uh, i would like to get uh, the panel's reaction for uh, somewhat slightly reorganizing the insurance system to split between the two mm. everybody walks towards the insurance uh, in <laughs> ceo okay. right <laughs> um you're absolutely right that, that we've organized our system in that way, um, and I think it would be very difficult, and in some ways I'd say the federal law reinforces the system we have, as opposed to the kind of disruption that that would cause. I guess the other way I'm thinking about it is back to the earlier comment about Walmart being a aggressive purchaser as in terms of the suppliers. And I never like to think of hospitals or physicians as suppliers, but technically they are in our system. And so I think the disadvantage we have in our system, we have to turn into an advantage in, in that we as, as insurance organizations have to be much more aggressive purchasers. And I think that can partially compensate for the re very real flaw that you've identified. But, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised, I'll ask Andrew to 
directly, or maybe I should ask the others. I wouldn't be surprised if over the next few years we see more plans that have the kind of additional cost for some providers selectively. You know, that if you want to go to the partner's hospital, that's fine, but it's a $500 payment versus the BI, which is a $200 right. payment versus the, yeah. the yeah. suburban yeah. hospital, which is right. $50 payment. And Tufts has a plan? Yeah, we, we have one now as well. In fact, I'm in one a plan like that. We call it our options plan. Okay. And um, that will be the fastest growing segment, at least in this market, of, of plans that place on the individual purchaser a much greater responsibility for distinguishing among. It still doesn't get completely to your division of catastrophic versus routine, but it will it will engage consumers in the in the purchase in a much more direct way. But it only works if we can give them information, comparative information on cost and quality, which is valid. And we're still in the early phases of doing that, but we're getting much better. I mean, in some ways, it's a more, it's a smarter form of cost sharing because it says, look, you need to go into the hospitals at hospital, so I'm not going to charge you something for a base for a basic thing. But if you want the teaching version of it, then you pay more. If you want the more expensive version of it, you pay more. So it's one can see it as kind of a level beyond the Singapore. Right. It also asks those who are providing care to rethink their price structures, right. and and that could be uh, as important. Singapore has three percent of the GDP. Uh, yeah. Whereas 16 percent we are spending. Right. So I think uh, the last set of comments was we'll have two kinds of two kinds of tiers in healthcare uh, as we try and fix it: TEARS and TIERS. Um, so let me just conclude with a, a comment. Um, we talked about the Bicknell lecture wanting to bring in thought-provoking ideas that sometimes conflict with each other, and I would ask people to leave with this thought in mind, um, and I, I apologize for overly uh, um, stereotyping, but I think in my mind, the fascinating thing that I got from this is perhaps I would say that David Cutler has proposed to us that if 15 years from now there are many more billionaires in um, healthcare, that would be a wonderful thing because we may actually have figured, those people may have figured out the secret sauce if you will. How do we make this complicated system really work better for everyone where we really do have value? And despite the fact that they may have extracted billions of dollars in profits, we may actually have a more affordable, higher value health system. I would characterize Leonard Glantz as having expressed the view that it would be awful if we had 10 more billionaires in healthcare, it would mean we have continued down a path where we just don't get it, um, where we are mischaracterizing healthcare to really be like Walmart, and that would be a tragedy. Um, and so lots of billionaires on the one hand would be a success. Another perspective is that it would be a, a, a tragedy. And uh, maybe you could, could muse on that for a bit, because I think it, it really gets to a lot of the schizophrenia we have trying to figure out where to go next in healthcare because we fundamentally disagree on that uh, dichotomy, if you will. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. It's been a wonderful morning. I particularly want to thank our panelists for their comments, their interchange, and most importantly, when we think about value these days, for their time. Thank you very much. <laughs>